thank you for the wonderful opportunity to speak at this excellent meeting. It's a great privilege and honor. I'd like to talk to you about the challenge of only eye surgery. About 25 years ago, I decided I wanted to specialize in operating on people who only had one eye. I'm a glaucoma specialist and I've operated on many thousands of eyes. Um, and I'd like to share some of my experience with you. I'm very mindful that I'm speaking to a very experienced audience and we only have a short amount of time. But what I hope I can do is share some clinical pearls and some of the lessons that I've learned along the way with that journey. So an only eye, you could define it as an eye where the vision in the fellow eye is less than 360. It may be that the patient feels that is their only functional eye. And it may be that the patient feels that loss of that only good eye would be life-changing with a profound impact on their life. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today will be available in two British Medical Journal um, open access papers. And for those people who are interested who do a lot of only eye surgery, there are two papers that I'm going to focus on. One is the experience of surgeons who do only eye surgery, and one is the experience of patients who undergo only eye surgery. And these are qualitative research papers where we listened to surgeons and patients involved in this type of surgery. And for me, as an only eye surgeon, there are really three main patient groups. The first group is relatively straightforward where there's only one good eye, but it's anatomically and functionally a normal eye. For example, if the fellow eye was lost through trauma. Then the second category is loss of fellow eye from an advanced disease like glaucoma, where the good eye may too have advanced disease. And finally, there's the third category, where the fellow eye was lost from a surgical complication, such as malignant glaucoma. And understandably, the patient would then be terrified of undergoing surgery on their only remaining good eye. I'm gonna talk about three things, safety, surgeon experience, and patient experience. And I'm going to go through at great speed, but perhaps if there are any questions, I'd be delighted to answer them at the end. So let's talk about safety. For me, only eye surgery is all about safety. And in 27 years of doing only eye surgery, I have lost one eye, one only eye. And um, it was devastating for the patients. And I have to tell you, it's pretty devastating for, for myself as well. And I have my checklist. Now, this is not an exhaustive checklist. This is assuming that all the basic stuff has been done. Things like risk of corneal failure, risk of retinal detachment, all that kind of stuff. But then this is what, what you're left with. So my first point on the checklist is consent and this concept of material risk. That risk in only eye surgery, the material risk is the risk of losing the eye completely and making sure that's communicated to the patient and their family and loved ones who may end up looking after the patient if there is a disaster. Then I'm going to quickly scoot through infection, bleeding, wipeout, malignant glaucoma, severe hypotony, decompression retinopathy, UV effusion, and tissue shortage and melting. And so for each patient I operate on, I run through this checklist and make sure that I've addressed each of the risk factors that could lead to loss of an eye. Let's start with infection. Some of the, some of the bugs that we get can be absolutely devastating. You've got streptococcus shown here. We've also got to be prepared to fight against pseudomonas. And endophthalmitis is a devastating complication in only eye surgery. And I think we're relatively good. If you look at this top center, we're relatively good at picking up people at high risk of endophthalmitis. There's, the top center picture is a man with severe destructive atopy and chronic colonization of the conjunctival fornices, the lid margins, and the skin around the eye. And there's a very good pearl here from someone called Frieda Sai, who would always say, you can't win in the eye if you're losing everywhere else in the body. You've got to get this sorted first. I also think we're very good at picking up blepharitis and nasolacrimal obstruction, you can see there. Perhaps what we're not quite so good at is some of the systemic risk factors that influence infection 
And these are getting more and more common as we have more elderly patients. You've got an infected leg ulcer there, which looks nasty and terrible dentition on the bottom right photograph. Now, these, this terrible dentition is releasing chronic bacteremia into the, into the bloodstream. And if like me, you're a glaucoma surgeon and implanting devices, maybe it's a barbell tube, a pawl tube, any kind of device, even an intraocular lens, you don't want transient bacteremias because they can settle on the implants. And in fact, the only eye that I lost was because of a man who had severe infected dentition. He always kept his mouth closed because he was so ashamed. So now, before I put a tube into anybody, I always get them to open their mouth and look at their teeth. Get your teeth fixed first. Bleeding, suprachoroidal hemorrhage. This picture on the left here is taken from just this week where one of my colleagues had an on-table suprachoroidal hemorrhage. It was well managed, as you can see, and just stopped it from going into the macula, millimeters away from disaster. And my pearl for suprachoroidal hemorrhage is think systemic. I've just written a book on the systemic challenges preoperatively and how to manage them. And I think that's a really important thing to think about. Is the patient on anticoagulants, NOAX, other drugs that interfere with platelets? Have they got a bleeding diathesis? Did they have a severe bleed when they had dental work or when they had a prostate operation? Take a good history. Do they bruise? And think about herbal remedies. Remedies such as ginkgo biloba are as potent as NOAC drugs, and patients don't tend to mention that they're on herbal remedies as part of the drug history. Wipeout. Wipeout is more common than people realize. We all know about the glaucoma patients with split fixation on their visual fields with reduced acuity. The glaucoma patient with reduced acuity is a dangerous beast. And here, you can see a trace from general anesthesia where during general anesthesia, there was a precipitous drop in the blood pressure and the patient wiped out and woke up with no vision. This patient was sent to me from elsewhere and every two or three years, I'll be sent a patient like this who's wiped out through general anesthesia or through a too high volume of local anesthesia in the orbit, maybe without hyaluronic hyalase um, during local anesthesia. Next one, we don't want to get malignant glaucoma. Now I'm going to return to malignant glaucoma in a while, but don't forget these are the eyes with anatomically short axial lengths. It's always helpful to have biometric data when you're operating on only eyes. The eyes with microcornea, tiny eyes deep set within the orbit. Um, maybe they've got angle closure, maybe they haven't, but get some biometric data. Hypotony. What are we going to do about hypotony to prevent that? Well, first of all, we've got to identify eyes that are at high risk of hypotony. These might be aphakic eyes. They may be eyes with pigment dispersion syndrome. Patients with atopy are very prone to hypotony. They might be very large eyes, such as high myopia or biophthalmos. They may be eyes with an abnormal connective tissue problem. So I always get the patient to put their thumb against their wrist. And if a patient can pop their thumb against their forearm, they may have hypermobility. If their kneecaps dislocate or they've had recurrent dislocations of their shoulder, think connective tissue disease. Then think about nutrition. We want to prevent wound leaks. Many of our elderly patients are just taking meals out of the fridge or out of the freezer. They don't have a good diet and are scorbutic, for example, with low levels of vitamin C. Remember that we can use doxycycline orally as an anticholaginolytic agent in patients we think are prone to wound leaks or who might not heal well. And I'd apply that even to cataract surgery. I put the bottom right picture on to remind us all that choroidal effusions start on table, so we don't want to have hypotony intraoperatively. We need to control the intraocular pressure even during surgery. Decompression retinopathy, simple and devastating. It's largely under the surgeon's control. Use your method of anesthesia. Use your first entry into the eye 
very controlled to make sure you don't have decompression retinopathy. Shouldn't really happen in the modern era. Then we've got uveal effusion. Now, uveal effusion is incredibly dangerous. It doesn't always come with a label. So we know that very short eyes, for example, nanophthalmus, uh, 20 millimeter axial length or less, we know that these eyes are prone to uveal effusion and we can measure posterior scleral thickness, more than 1.6 millimeters being abnormal. We can look for choroidal effusion. We can look for supraciliary effusion on the UBM, which is the earliest sign of uveal effusion. These eyes are dangerous. They're often small eyes, deep set within the head, and they have this anomalous vasculature from elevated episcleral venous pressure because the eye is jammed in the orbit. These eyes are very dangerous. And I would say, if you're gonna lose an eye, uveal effusion, if it's missed, is a real problem. And remember, there are two types of uveal effusion. There's nanophthalmic uveal effusion with a very short axial length, but there's also uveal effusion syndrome where there might be a normal axial length of 23. But in each case, you have thickened posterior sclera and other signs of uveal effusion. Finally, melting and tissue shortage. Very important if you're putting hardware like a Barvelt 350 tube into the orbit. Always check for tissue mobility and very thin tissue and tissue shortage. If you can't evert the upper lid, you've got tissue shortage. If you've got cicatricial change with loss of canthal anatomy, you've got tissue shortage. And if you've got uncontrolled atopy or systemic vasculitis, you're at risk of wound melting. All these things, you can lose eyes. So that was a very brief overview. I could love to talk for an hour on each one of those, but if you cover all of those domains, all of those elements, you're unlikely to lose an eye. I'm now gonna talk about surgeon experience. I've got to that stage in my life where I'm training younger surgeons to do only eye surgery, and I want them to be resilient. So the paper in the British Medical Journal, for those of you who do or train only eye surgeons is very important. How do you increase their skill levels preoperatively, intraoperatively and postoperatively. And I think all of us as experienced surgeons have a duty to share our knowledge. What support networks do those surgeons have in place? They must not be isolated. What training are you actively doing to help your young surgeons on that journey to do large numbers, tens, hundreds, thousands of ONEIs? How do you get them comfortable doing that? It's all within the paper. How do they cope? How do they survive the stress of doing these eyes day after day after day, perhaps when things don't go wrong? What techniques can you use such as visualization and faith to help you get through this journey? And finally, losing an only eye. From personal experience, I can tell you it's devastating when you lose the only eye of a patient and we need better support networks to help our young surgeons because if you do enough only eye surgery there is a 100 probability it will happen to one of your patients and to you as a surgeon and most importantly we need to create a culture where patient where surgeons want to do only eye surgery so we have to have a no blame culture a learning culture And remember that adverse events in theater impact on surgeons as well as patients. So for example, there's a great paper in the British Journal of Surgery here, the impact of adverse events on surgeons. And this paper for the first time articulates how adverse events for patients can actually damage the mental health of surgeons. It's a very important piece of work. And I also have, a, for my young colleagues, a burnout checklist and three domains of how to avoid isolation, how to enhance their well-being, and how to build resilience. And you need to look at all of these things if you're going to be a surgeon doing huge numbers of only eye surgery. You need to be at your best the whole time. There are lots of resources to prevent burnout. 
Um, the American Academy Physician Burnout Webinars are excellent. And the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK have a brilliant survival guide, which is very applicable to surgeons. I'm going to finish with some of our work, again, published in the British Medical Journal on patient experience. How can we make that experience for patients undergoing only eye surgery better? How can we understand the emotional impact it has on them, the fear, the depression, the distress? How can we understand better ways to help them cope? And how can we make that experience better by a more empathic approach? Let's imagine if there are hundreds of people on this, on this uh, webinar now, you know, some of us are going to end up having only eye surgery. None of us think we're going to end up with just one eye, but many of us will. So we, it, it's lovely to read the actual papers if you're interested in this area, to see what patients say about how devastating and how horrendous it is, how terrifying it is to undergo only eye surgery. It's a humbling experience to listen to. And post-op, what can we do post-op? Now in some glaucoma operations, we have to patch the eye in the sense that we need to protect the corneal epithelium because if the epithelium is a bit dodgy and it falls off, you then can't use post-op steroids and you're into kind of melting situations. So sometimes we have to pad and patch the eye, but how can we make that journey better for patients undergoing only eye surgery? And we have lots of suggestions within our work. So I'm going to wind up there in case there's any questions, but my advice for those of you who do huge numbers of only eye surgery, who want to, or who want to teach only eye surgery, is have a kind of checklist. Have something that you look at meticulously so that the risk of losing an only eye will fall well below one in a thousand. And then we can reassure ourselves and reassure our patients truly that the risk of them losing the eye is minimal. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Peter. If you can stop sharing now, that would be brilliant. Um, Peter, thank you uh, for that incredibly insightful talk, which is addressing not the book knowledge that we all learned a long time ago, but the actual experience of uh, working with and operating on patients. And I particularly uh, reflect on the fact that for many of us, the sort of surgery we're doing on only eyes is a 15 minute cataract operation. And because we do so many, we sometimes forget the stress that even uh, when you've got two eyes that surgery can have on our patients. And we need to be mindful about our patients' perceptions, fears, concerns, and give them the time to, 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 to prepare for it. And if it's done under local, I think talking them through it, reassuring them gently as you're going along is a very important step. I think, Peter, we're having questions at the end, I think. Um, so uh, I'd like at this stage to invite uh, another good friend of mine, Will Dean, um, who I just trying to remember, Will, did I meet you first in East Africa? In Tanzania, yes. I think I did. And on, I think on the I, way to the, Kilimanjaro. <laughs> absolutely. And I think probably the first thing I really noticed about you was your incredibly efficient coffee on out of the country system where you would pack your own ground coffee and you had a metal vacuum <laughs> flask coffee maker with you. And most kindly of all, you gave me one, which I still use to this day. So thanks very much. I'd better let you get on with your talk on, on surgical simulation training. So if you can share your screen, thanks. Thank you. Um, let me just stop that. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, namaste, good evening, uh, everyone. And thank you very much for the, the very kind uh, invitation uh, to speak uh, this evening with you. Um, is that um, screen sharing okay? Yes, I'm seeing it. Yep. Brilliant. So I'd, I'd like to spend the next uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so talking about the role of surgery simulation in ophthalmology training. And it, it does talk a little bit about the stress 
of surgical education and surgical um, surgical training. Um, um, the traditional model of surgical education, the Halstedian model, apprentice model of see one, do one, teach one, takes a very long time uh, and is, is very stressful. Stressful for uh, the trainee, uh, often surrounded by a number of other trainees, uh, the theatre nurse, uh, professor, uh, consultant. It's uh, very stressful for the trainer, anyone who's taught um, surgery and especially only eye surgery on a on a on a, a an awake surgical patient understands how exceptionally stressful it can be for the trainer, and of course it's it's very stressful uh, for the patient uh, who may know that they are being operated on by uh, a trainee. However, uh, there is a huge need uh, to train more eye surgeons uh, globally uh, and to train them efficiently and safely. Um, the most recent estimates uh, from the Global Burden of Disease uh, Study Group show that there are 53 million people um, who are blind uh, globally and nearly 300 million with uh, moderate and severe visual impairment. Um, and if all the people with uh, blindness and moderate and severe visual impairment from cataract were to be operated on, we would need to perform collectively 130 million cataract operations in the, um, just to clear that backlog. Um, India has amongst the highest cataract surgical rates globally at over 6,000 cases per million per year. Uh, worldwide, there are 230,000 ophthalmologists. Um, the highest proportion per population is in Greece at 182 ophthalmologists per million population. India has uh, over 17,000 ophthalmologists, 13 per million. And, and the lowest proportion is in sub-Saharan Africa with uh, just over between two and three ophthalmologists per million population. Um, for cataract surgical training, well, it's, it's a challenge. And in terms of numbers in sub-Saharan Africa, the median number of cataract surgeries performed by ophthalmology residents by the end of their second year of training was zero. Um, in mainland China, the median number of cataract surgeries performed by senior trainees at the end of their three years of training was also zero. In India, um, an excellent recent sur um, survey showed that the median number of cataract surgeries performed independently during residency was um, 18 extra caps, uh, 55 uh, manual small incision cataracts, and a median of one FACO. However, there's a lot of variability in India as you can see by the mean and standard deviation, which was higher uh, than the median, um, but a, a large standard deviation, and especially for FACO uh, emulsification. Um, a, an invited uh, recent editorial uh, published in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology uh, stated that the uh, All India Ophthalmological Society and a few other state ophthalmological societies are doing an excellent job in skills transfer courses where many residents and fellows get exposure by, to excellent surgical skills transfer courses by, by, by experts. And most medical colleges are still focused exclusively on manual small incision cataract surgery and even traditional um, ECI. Um, in the majority of state medical colleges, uh, there is little to no hands-on training in FACO and they concluded that wet lab and simulation can be very helpful option for learning the various steps of FACO before, and this is the key part, before proceeding to live hands-on surgical uh, training um, and also provided a stress-free environment. And that is very much what I'd like to, like to um, talk about. So there's a huge need uh, to train more surgeons uh, safely, um, efficiently and effectively? And is there a role for surgery simulation in ophthalmology training? What simulation is not is a replacement for live surgical education with a dedicated uh, mentor and trainer. It's not a one size fits all solution. It's not a surrogate for um, motivation, personal motivation and self-driven participation in, in one's own surgical education. And it's certainly not merely the presence of a wet lab or the availability of a wet lab. Um, and speaking to the audience this evening as um, surgeons, if you were given the option of 
training um, the surgeon in live surgical situation in theatre tomorrow and Monday, would you prefer to be training uh, the trainee on the left, uh, trying to perform their first uh, manual small incision cataract surgery, not particularly well, um, or the exact same surgeon on the right after having participated in an intense simulation-based surgical uh, training program for manual small incision cataract surgery. And this is from data from the Olympics trial, which I'll be summarizing uh, in a few minutes, uh, and is exactly the same trainee uh, four days uh, later after an intense simulation training course. Simulation skill centers, wet labs, dry labs, they exist in various guises uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world, but it's important to say that simulation-based surgical education is not merely the presence of a wet lab or the availability of a dry lab microscope or a skill center. Um, there are numerous simulation models around in addition to animal eyes and cadaver eyes. Um, and he here are some of the artificial eyes that are available as well as computerized simulators, the eyes eye and the help me see uh, simulators um, are the, the, the most popular at the moment. A, a critical re review of simulation-based medical education um, showed that um, a number of facets are critical and needed for simulation-based surgical education to work. Uh, there needs to be feedback given to the trainee. The trainees need to be able to engage in sustained and deliberate practice. There needs to be a curriculum and curriculum integration. There needs to be outcome a measurement of competency. There has to be fidelity, um, a transfer to practice, uh, team training, instructor training, and context. And I'd like to add to that list the importance of reflective learning in the process, as well as personal motivation to uh, engage in and want to become a better surgeon. Uh, an eminent professor, uh, Roger Kneebone at uh, Imperial College London, stated in his book um, that simulation offers an environment in which learners can train until they reach specific levels of competency, specified levels of competency. And there are huge benefits to patients. Um, the uh, Royal College of Ophthalmologists uh, National Ophthalmology Database study uh, showed over huge numbers of uh, cataracts that um, the uh, complication rate, uh, PCR rate, um, reduced dramatically up to 40% with the availability of an eyesight trainer. Um, the potential of simulation uh, is very wide. Well, it's the initial uh, learning of a particular skill, uh, a particular technique, whether that's glaucoma or cataract surgery. Uh, it can enable practicing rare or uncommon complications. Uh, it's potentially useful in the return to surgical practice after a period of absence, whether that's maternity or paternity leave or injury or illness or sabbatical or a, a global pandemic. Um, it's very useful in the maintenance of skills and it could be useful in uh, assessment as well as team training. For the initial technique skills learning, I'd like to focus on cataract and glaucoma, but emphasize that we are talking about taking a novice cataract surgeon through the stage of advanced beginner to competent. Gaining proficiency and expertise or mastery can only really be um, gained in a live surgical training uh, setting. So for simulation-based surgical education to work very well, um, it's, it's helpful to deconstruct a surgical technique, for example, manual small incision cataract surgery, provide instruction in each of the steps and provide feedback on how the trainees are performing as they engage in sustained deliberate practice of particular steps. Once they've practiced all the particular deconstructed uh, steps, they um, can perform a full procedure, um, record it, and then uh, engage in reflective learning as they measure their performance against an outcome assessment. And obviously fidelity of the simulation itself uh, is, is very important as is personal motivation. Um, so here we can see the uh, stages of uh, manual small incision cataract surgery deconstructed, um, instruction provided and further feedback, sustained deliberate practice. Um, I always use the analogy of the karate kid uh, the wax on, wax off, uh, reflective learning in a digital dry lab. Um, here, 
um, using STEMI 305 microscopes linked to a, a digital classroom and the trainees recording their performance here of a uh, simulation trabeculectomy, uh, which they can then watch back and mark uh, themselves um, using an outcome assessment and, um, of a ophthalmic simulated surgical competency, assess competency assessment rubric, uh, which we validated here for M6 and we've also validated and published for uh, surgical trabeculectomy. Um, and others are also available. And again, uh, we're trying to answer the question as trainers, as surgeons, who would you prefer to take to a live surgical training uh, setting? Uh, the trainee on the left or a trainee on the right who's engaged in an intense and successful um, training um, program. Um, we tested this and published um, two of the first uh, randomized controlled trials uh, assessing intense simulation-based uh, training. Uh, the first was for manual small incision cataract surgery, the Olympics trial, where we uh, randomized uh, 50 resident trainees from East and Central Africa to intervention and control group. And the intervention group uh, came to a dedicated simulation uh, skill center at the University of Cape Town and engaged in, in a one week program of intense simulation training for, for M6. Control group trainees um, stayed at home and uh, came for training one year later. We um, recorded three uh, surgical procedures as I previously showed um, at baseline and then the primary outcome measure was their surgical competency at the three month period. And this was the results of the Olympics trial. At baseline, out of a possible score on the Sim Oscar of 40, um, intervention uh, group trainees scored a mean of just over 25% or 10, nearly 11 out of 40. And that increased after the training to nearly 74% or 33.7. Uh, that competence was maintained over the one year period. And then the control trainees who had their training after the one year period, they increased as well. Um, confidence, self-reported confidence scores uh, doubled and the trainees went on to perform two and a half times more live surgery in the year after the simulation training. Complication rates, PCR rates, reduced by 72% in the intervention group uh, in the one year following the training. Um, just to back this up, we performed a second completely independent randomized control trial following a similar methodology uh, with more senior trainees and a different uh, group of uh, 51 uh, trainees, uh, again from East Africa, uh, were randomized uh, to the intervention control group. And we published this as the GLASS trial, the Glaucoma Simulated Surgery trial, uh, with the same methodology, all using an intense four, five day simulation course. And the results were profound with a a trebling of competence after trabeculectomy simulation training, and that competence uh, was maintained over a one-year period, uh, and the control group uh, also trebled their competence after their training intervention. Uh, Self-reported uh, confidence increased, and the uh, trainees who had undertaken the simulation training went on to perform 20 times more trabeculectomy procedures in the in the one year after training. How have we taken this forward uh, more recently um, is with the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, uh, uh, even a couple of weeks ago, we um, carried out a very successful digital dry lab, uh, the TRAB lab, um, and this was uh, our first web lab where uh, the Royal College of Ophthalmologists uh, Simulation Skills Center had uh, 20 trainees and simultaneously for the uh, trabeculectomy simulation uh, training day, um, a simulation uh, unit in Glasgow, East Anglia and South Devon zoomed in uh, for the day uh, for, the, for the lectures and for the discussions and then they had their uh, simulation uh, equipment and instruments and digital dry lab uh, where they would engage in practice and then we would all come back together and I think that this model of uh, remote uh, mentoring and web labs and, and, and sharing um, of uh, surgical education and simulation training will be the way forward and exceptionally useful uh, nowadays with available technology and also with uh, travel um, being being curtailed. Um, and this model will, 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 will benefit us all in further democratizing um, 
ophthalmic surgical education as we go forward. I've also recently, uh, predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa, set up a network of digital dry labs and web, web labs through the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the University of Cape Town, uh, currently in Cameroon, and Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Togo, and Uganda, and uh, hopefully soon Ethiopia. And I think it's, it's a valuable model for sharing surgical education uh, resources. And uh, we will hopefully gather more data from the utility and the efficacy and the safety of this training model uh, going forwards for cataracts and glaucoma surgery, but also uh, potentially for, for many other surgeries, including um, ocular plastics, uh, vitreoretinal and others. Um, and just to finish, just a quick reminder of um, the fact that we, something that we inherently all know, um, but that the Olympics and glass trials prove that merely the availability of a skills lab or a, or a wet lab is, is not if effective in uh, surgical education on its own. All of these facets need to be employed within a, a surgical, a simulation surgical education program uh, for it to be effective in impacting uh, the surgical competence, the surgical confidence um, of trainees and ultimately um, patient safety. Um, once again, a huge thank you for your very kind invitation uh, to speak at this evening's event. Uh, it's a, a real honor and a real pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will. That's brilliant. Um, can I ask you to, oh uh, no, you have already stopped sharing. Brilliant. Um, could we move swiftly on and invite Harry Jaram to, uh, to talk and share his screen? This. Is that coming up, Mike? Yes, I can see that. Thank you. Perfect. So um, good afternoon and, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak in, in today's session. So my remit um, was to talk about glaucoma. And what I wanted to do was just really share our experience from Moorfields in London and how we have had to change the how we deliver care to our glaucoma patients in the in the past um, 18 months that has been challenging for all of us across the world. Um, these are my disclosures. Now, what I'm going to um, talk to you today, just, in, just to summarise, is first of all, I'm sure many of you know about this, but I'm just going to briefly introduce the concept of the UK National Health Service. Um, I'm then going to share with you how we deliver glaucoma care before, during and in response to the pandemic. And then finally, I'd like to touch on how I think the future of glaucoma care in the UK is likely to look in this new world that we now live in. So first of all, the, the UK National Health Service. Now, in 1948, there was a historic moment that um, occurred in British history, which was really a culmination of a bold and pioneering plan to make healthcare no longer exclusive to those who could just afford it, but to make it accessible to everyone. And the National Health Service was launched by the then Minister of Health, um, Anurin Bevin, in Britain's post-war government at the Park Hospital in Manchester, and sh shown on the picture on the, on the left. And it was here, really over 70 years ago now, that the motivation to provide strong and reliable health care to all finally took its first tentative steps. Now, what's interesting is in the past 70 years since its inception, the NHS has grown considerably. Now, considering the relatively small size of the UK as a country, it's quite surprising to me that the NHS is actually the world's fifth largest employer. In this, in this little chart, chart here, it sits behind the US Department of Defense, the Chinese Army, Walmart, um, and McDonald's. Now, this is my challenging attempt to summarize NHS budgets and funding in, in, in a single slide, which is almost an impossible task. But essentially, the budget for healthcare in the UK comes from the, the Treasury within, within central government. Now, spending on capital projects, um, regulation, public health, and including vaccination programs is all, all managed, managed here. Next, money is then passed on to what's called NHS England, who oversee the delivery of some services delivered at a national level, for example, specialised cancer, cancer care. 
And then the majority of the budget is then passed on to local commissioning groups who then buy services for their local patient population from providers. For example, in London, um, eye care may be purchased from Moorfields. The other thing that is, is a, a big priority within the NHS is this concept of efficiency and cost savings. And these me mechanisms are really enshrined at every step within NHS funding to try to maximise value for public money. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the expenditure in healthcare um, amongst, let's say, G7 countries in this graph, and there is a clear binary difference in healthcare spending between a country such as the USA um, and the other G7 countries, such as the UK, as a percentage of GDP is shown in this graph. Um, and, and what's interesting to me is that the, the UK does have the second lowest healthcare expenditure of all G7 countries. And it's always interesting um, to highlight that spending money does not always lead to better health outcomes. Now, this is a graph that shows healthcare spending per capita against life expectancy for many countries across the world. Um, and what is quite interesting here is that you know, the United States spends a significant amount more than other countries, yet the outcomes are in many ways um, lower or certainly not superior for that um, additional investment. Now, prior to the COVID pandemic, um, I'll talk to you about Moorfields to start with. Moorfields is the probably the largest eye hospital in Europe. In the glaucoma service um, alone, we have um, around 27 faculty members. And in 2019, prior to the pandemic, we saw about just approximately 120,000 outpatient attendances within the glaucoma service um, alone. The past five years have seen a marked increase in both outpatient and surgical activity. And in order to meet this demand, we have a, a, a stratified three-tier system of care within the glaucoma service. So this is led by consultants and um, also components that are led by optometrists. Um, and also we have a, a significant what we call asynchronous or virtual um, clinical review service. Now, in all honesty, even before the pandemic, the, the, the delivery of timely glaucoma care was a challenge in the UK. There were several high profile cases of patients losing sight due to delayed appointments. Um, these led to national investigations highlighting the issues and really the, the, the need for better fail safe management. Um, and, and really this challenge is, is, is really related to the fact that our, we have an aging population who are living longer. And ultimately, this leads to a mismatch between demand and capacity within the, the um, hospital eye services for chronic eye diseases such as glaucoma. Now, the onset, onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we, our, our Prime Minister eventually announced a nationwide lockdown on the 23rd of March. Um, this photo shows um, the view from the Houses of Parliament in London um, on the first day of lockdown. Now, if any of you have been to London before, you know, this is normally packed with tourists and commuters. Um, so this really just emphasizes what the impact of lockdown was on, 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 on London and uh, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a daily, daily, live, daily, daily life um, at the time of lockdown. Now this lasted for about three months with some restrictions eased on the 23rd of June. We then had a four week national lockdown in, in December, 2020. Um, and then our third national lockdown was for almost four months, starting in January 2021, coinciding with the more deadly second wave of the pandemic, with restrictions easing in April. Now, from the outset, it was it was clear that the pandemic was was really going to redefine how we deliver glaucoma care, both not just immediately, but in the years ahead. Now, our initial priorities really included risk stratification. And in a, in, a sim, in a most sort of simplistic manner, we were trying to balance the risk of sight loss from glaucoma against the risk of death from coronavirus. We really needed to focus on our patients that were more, more urgent and had real clinical need. And we also needed to protect our vulnerable patients and staff from the pandemic, which at the time was rampaging across London in particular. Now, within our glaucoma service, we really tore up our timetables and ran a paired back face to face clinics with multiple faculty members and fellows. Um, and we had a, a pretty robust backup structure because we had a rolling absence amongst staff of around 20% due to coronavirus infection in the first wave. 
Um, two members of staff at Moorfields died during the first wave of the pandemic, one of whom uh, worked within the glaucoma service. Um, in terms of our new patients, we really only saw um, urgent, internal urgent internal referrals and a cases of acute angle closure. And we used surrogate me measures of high risk when trying to work out for our existing patients who we ought to, ought to see as a priority. Now, these included recent glaucoma surgery and an intended follow-up interval of, of less than four weeks. And in terms of um, medium and what we thought were low-risk patients, we cancelled 40,000 appointments at the end of March with telephone consultations to touch base and, and to try to reassure our patients where possible. For three months, the surgical management of glaucoma drastically changed. Um, we had, um, we had no, no cases of general anesthesia um, due to the, this being an aerosol generating procedure and the risk of in increased viral spread. Intervention for uncontrolled eye pressure was limited to a temporizing cyclodiode laser in order to reduce the COVID exposure risk for both patients and staff. And the only cataract surgery that was performed was for acute angle closure. However, our, our surgical workload was, was um, still quite busy because most other London hospitals had completely closed their eye care services due to the need, need to staff and run COVID wards and makeshift ICUs. What was really quite nice was how in the UK, the National Health Service really came together in response to the pandemic. Um, there was a temporary intensive care unit called the Nightingale Hospital that was built in London um, at the, uh, one of the largest ex exhibition centres. Um, within two weeks and opened by Prince Charles. Um, there were significant redeployments of staff across the NHS with a couple of us from Moorfields working within our local intensive care unit um, at the Royal Free Hospital in London. And really the sense of camaraderie across NHS staff and the national pride and gratitude for our healthcare system was, was very apparent across the nation. Now, between the lockdowns, the primary challenge was to, you know, how on earth do we manage the 40,000 patients whose appointments we've canceled? Um, we need to ensure timely monitoring and, and really reduce the risk of preventable vision loss. Now, prior to the pandemic, despite us having a, a three-tier stratified care system at Moorfields, we still saw over 80% of our patients in a face-to-face -face setting. And these were usually, you know, your typical overbook clinics, very long waits, packed waiting rooms, which was clearly no longer an option in the, in the, in the, in the peri-pandemic era. So in order to increase throughput whilst maintaining social dis distancing, we rapidly expanded our technician-led diagnostic or virtual clinics during the COVID response and also after uh, restrictions ease. So we moved to almost 80% um, um, uh, patients uh, seen, seen in, a, in a virtual setting. Now, virtual clinics are where patients essentially ascend to, tend to have all of their glaucoma diagnostic tests performed by a technician during approximately a 40 minute attendance before going home. And this really aimed to minimize the time spent by patients in a hospital setting. The clinical data is then reviewed asynchronously with an adjunctive telephone consultation um, to the patient if, if, um, if required. Now, what's interesting is that the, the, the existing UK guidance for running virtual clinics only recommends patients at the lowest risk, such as those with ocular hypertension, glaucoma suspects, and very early primary open angle glaucoma. And what we did was during the pandemic, we carried out an analysis of around 8,000 patients who were monitored over a, over a three year period with expanded eligibility criteria, quite similar to the medium risk patients that we had had to cancel at the start of lockdown. And we found that um, expanding the eligibility criteria enabled us to increase the capacity whilst maintaining high quality care in a manner that was um, acceptable and safe to patients also. Now, another thing that we developed um, during the, the, the pandemic recovery was what we call rapid glaucoma assessment clinics. Now, the reason for this was that how do we know whether patients who we had stratified as low risk in fact, remain low risk over time. Could low risk patients, in fact, be unstable and losing vision due to repeated deferrals? So the way we did this was, um, th these are run at weekends um, and they were very, very simple. Um, there was a telephone consultation from a clinician. The patient attended for a check of their visual acuity and intraocular pressure. 
Um, and then there was a subsequent um, review of the notes and a telephone consultation if needed. And we saw um, around 250 patients per site per day at a weekend. And, and really what we were trying to see were patients who would otherwise have had no interaction with a glaucoma specialist because they were deemed to have been such such. Um, um, low risk. So it was really to touch base with many, of many, with many of these patients. Now, this helped us to rapidly address the outpatient backlog because we, first of all, had a rapid sustained increase in clinical activity in a COVID secure manner. So we, for the patients that had not been seen, we were, we were managing to get back in touch with them and essentially re-risk stratify them on more up-to-date data. We were able to identify patients who were in fact unstable and required a change in management um, based upon the data that was collected. And I think most importantly, like I just mentioned, it enabled us to accurately risk stratify patients using more up-to-date um, and, 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 and accurate data compared to what may have been on our records from two, three years ago. Now, just to finish off, the third concept that has gained significant traction in the UK recently is the concept of a diagnostic hub. Now, patients have um, significant concerns about attending a hospital setting, um, using busy, packed public transport and trains. So the question that's been asked is, can monitoring be performed outside a traditional hospital set setting? Can we have care closer to home? Is it more convenient? And again, with this um, asynchronous or, or virtual review, um, these are generally very well suited for specialties such as glaucoma um, and medical retina that are very imaging dominated um, and are suitable for high volume care. Now, one of the projects that I'm involved with, along with Professor Paul Foster and Professor Shobha Shiva Pasad um, at Moorfields, is, is what's called Project Hercules. And I just want to in introduce you to this concept to start with. So we were awarded just over 3.2 million pounds from the um, NIHR to design and test iterations of a diagnostic hub, really to find the most cost-effective and patient-friendly model of care. Um, and a few months ago, we opened a, a reconfigurable diagnostic hub at Brent Cross Shopping Centre in North London, which is one of the largest shopping malls in the London region. Now, due to the decline and challenges of the retail industry, um, we took over a large retail unit that used to be a, a, a shopping a sh a clothes shop, actually. And with the help of healthcare architects, we've set up a technician-led diagnostic, diagnostic eye clinic for medical retina and glaucoma patients. And we're currently seeing a few thousand patients per week. Um, and now this is this over the over the past six to eight months, this has been redesigned three times to test different layouts and configurations. And it's a it, it's been a fantastic experience. It's a truly um, collaborative and multidisciplinary experience involving clinicians and researchers across all disciplines, including healthcare architects, experts in the modeling of the flow of people and queuing theory, health economists, um, and also with support from industry um, in helping this get set up. And what we do hope to achieve from this is really to inform national policy on how to design and run diagnostic hubs for chronic eye diseases. And the main research questions that we're hoping to address are what are the patient's preferences for rapid diagnostic hubs for people with stable and chronic eye conditions? What are the factors that influence the implementation and delivery of care in these rapid diagnostic hubs? What are the effects of different models, forms of, and, and layouts um, on the delivery of care and patient outcomes? And probably most importantly for the UK National Health Service, do these hubs deliver cost-effective and value-based healthcare? So just to conclude, I think delivering timely glaucoma care has been and continues to be a challenge for our aging population. COVID-19 has forced us to adapt and also innovate into how we deliver care um, in the post-pandemic era. And I think diagnostic hubs do have the potential to increase capacity for chronic eye disease and meet the in increasing demand for glaucoma care in the decades ahead. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Harry. Um, that was brilliant. And I think it's a clear example of Whereas consultants, as leaders in our specialty, we need to be involved in the service delivery design aspects. It's not just good enough to know how to do the trabeculectomy. It's about how to train our colleagues up to the level that they're competent to work at 
and also how we get to see the large number of patients that uh, we see every, every day. So thank you very much. I think it's actually my go now. So uh, I'll see if I can share my own screen. Everybody else has been able to do it. So if somebody could flag that they can see that. Yep, that looks great, Mike. Excellent. So what's equally good is the fact that uh, I now live outside Birmingham. I'm sorry to, to upset Peter Shaw and Susie Mullen, but I now live in the countryside in the in more northerly aspects. Uh, so this is a view not too far from my house. Um, I am sort of doing a sort of slightly, um, a few separate issues that I've uh, got interested in through various aspects of my additional work, uh, uh, apart from being a neuro ophthalmologist. I think uh, suddenly uh, he is not visible. We seem to have lost him. Uh, he's not uh, probably locked back. Yeah, he's come back. Yeah. Dr. Michael, all okay? Dr. Michael? Professor Susan, would you like to go next? Oh, there he is. That's all right. I'm back, but hopefully, oh. for some reason, my screen disappeared. Can you see me? Can you see me and my screen at the moment? We can see you, Not Mike. Your screen. Okay, I'll try sharing the screen again. Okay. And we'll go back up to there. Can you see that? Great. You can still see that now? Yep. Audit, yes, audit, sorry. I'm not sure what happened then, but I'll carry on. So my interest in audit is partly because I'm now chair of the steering group for the National Ophthalmology Database Audit, which I'm about to describe. Now, medical audit actually goes back a long way. Apparently, King Hammurabi, the sixth king of Babylon, instigated this concept for clinicians by instructing them to measure their care against agreed standards. And amongst the many laws written on the Code of Hammurabi is law 215, which basically says, if you as a physician heals a patient, the person's eye, you will be rewarded with 10 shekels of silver. However, two, law 218 says that if you blind the person's eye, they will cut off your hand. So uh, probably a bit more... Uh, uh, punishment than we would like to meet out these days in the NHS. Now it's interesting listen to Harry's uh, talk because it is a reflection of how we work in the United Kingdom in the NHS and despite the fact the NHS started in 1948 it took a long time for the concept of audit to really work its way through and it took a certain number of, of adverse events, including complications of high rates of complications of cardiac surgery in Bristol, for people to start saying, it is not good enough for you to believe you can do something well, you have to prove it. And in a white paper uh, that was presented to Parliament in 1989, the concept of audit in the NHS was introduced, but it still took to 1997 in another white paper, the new NHS, where clinical governance, the need to monitor and appropriately manage the health service and your clinical responsibility, and the concept of clinical audit, the key mechanism by which healthcare professionals measure the quality of care uh, was really laid out. And alongside it, they established uh, NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, as it was called at that time. So I'm sure many of us are familiar with the concept of medical audit. It was defined by NICE and the Commission for Health Improvement in 2002. Um, it, by that definition, a quality improvement process that seeks to improve patient care and outcomes through a systematic review of care against explicit criteria 
and the implementation of change. So the concept of an audit cycle, as you can see there, uh, is, is well established in the United Kingdom and uh, increasingly well implemented. But one of the key issues about audits uh, is, is what standard, who should you compare yourself with? And in the past, there was a tendency to compare yourself with yourself and saying, yes, I'm still doing as well as I did last year. Um, perhaps more usefully, you could compare yourself with other people in your department. And that may make you realize you're not quite as good as you thought. But unfortunately, there may well be inherent systemic problems within that department that limits uh, your full understanding of whether your department uh, and you are as good as you think you should be. So ultimately, perhaps the best way of comparing yourself is against your whole peer group on a national basis. And this is the aim of the pioneers, Rob Johnson unfortunately passed away, John Sparrow and others back in 2005, who for the first time using electronic databases was able to pull data uh, in this first paper from 162 surgeons from eight trusts on 16,000 operations and start to work out whether they can start developing useful information to allow one surgeon to compare himself or herself against another and one department against another. They went on and by 2012, they had analyzed 55,000 operations from, from 406 surgeons in 12 trusts. The vast majority, not surprisingly, were PACO. And at that time, they had a 1.92% PC rupture rate, which was, again, not surprisingly highest for junior and low volume surgeons. And they used the additional data they got from the patient's electronic patient records to start to develop a concept of low risk and high risk categories. And they also demonstrated, again, perhaps not surprisingly, that PC rupture was the only modifiable risk factor for subsequent visual loss. And these days, the National Ophthalmology Database is, I would like to say a well-oiled machine, but I'm trying to make it as well-oiled as we can within the financial constraints we face. But essentially, it is quite a complex system based on uh, obtaining data from existing electronic patient records in the vast majority of cases, passing the data anonymously onto the analysis system, developing the results and eventually passing on to the people that need to know. And uh, the last analysis based on 2018-19 data uh, analyzed from that year, 241,000 cataract operations. And you can go online now as a surgeon, provided you've done over 50 cases, you can get your own assessment. So one of the key metrics is PC rupture rate. Um, and the oval rate of that year was 1.1%, and this surgeon had no PC rupture. The overall rate of visual loss uh, was 0.9%, which I think was a loss of three lines. And again, this surgeon had none, and I'm pleased to say that was me. Um, but I would also say, I'm not so pleased to say that I only did 88 operations that year. And then by hospital, uh, this is my unit where we, uh, again, compared to national standards, can say with some degree of confidence that we did uh, the right, we did, we did well in our surgery. Now, you could argue that simply by publishing data, we're not really completing the audit cycle because we're not implementing change. The only implementable change that we do at the moment is identifying people who are free standard deviations from the mean. And there are actually very few individuals or departments in that category. But since 2010, um, there has been a 40% reduction in the PC rupture rate from 1.91 to 1.14. Uh, and I think this is a combination of some surgeons looking at their data and saying, actually, I'm not enjoying this. I'm not particularly good at this. I will leave. But also, there may well be uh, some centers like this one where there were systemic problems. I think their microscope was fixed to the ceiling of a building that tended to shake. Um, and when they finally showed this figure to their manager enough times, they implemented change and the next year, their complication rate had fallen considerably. As well as the reduction in PC rupture rate was a significant reduction in the number of patients suffering uh, visual loss as a result of our surgery. So 
I mentioned risk stratification. We now have a model which gives us a likelihood of uh, whether somebody is going to have a complication of PC rupture. And on the left, this is a person who's a very straightforward cataract. Uh, you've got a fundal view, the patient's able to lie flat, and essentially this person has probably got, with consultant operating, a PC rupture risk of 0.75%. By contrast, even though a consultant surgeon is doing it, on the right hand side, we've got an elderly patient who's not able to lie flat, there's no fundal view, they've had a previous trabeculectomy, and now the risk of this person having a PC rupture during the surgery is 30%. So we can start using this big data to uh, inform who should operate. And in fact, the nice guidelines on cataract surgery said we should consider using a stratification algorithm to decide who should have the surgery, at what level, sorry, at what level the surgeon should be to perform that surgery. And there's also the additional use of the data potentially. This graph shows the number of operations versus the adjusted PC rupture rate. And it's clear to me there is a rapid decrease in your risk of having a PC rupture the more operations you do. And perhaps it's time, and we are working on this at the college, to start saying this data suggests that maybe you should do at least 200 to 250 cases a year in order to be competent at the operation. And this, is, this in turn allows you to contemplate workforce planning. How many surgeons do we need to do to deliver the number of operations we need? And it also has important implications on how we train our juniors. So I'll stop there and move on to guidelines. And as has already been mentioned, the National Health Service was set up in, in July in, in 1948 with the aim that it would meet the needs of everyone, that it would be free at the point of delivery and that it be based on clinical need, not ability to pay. And I think it's a brilliant innovation that Britain should be proud of. However, it has not been without its problems over many years. And uh, in 1997, um, it was recognized that there was an inequality in access and quality of care across the United Kingdom. And as part of its attempts to change this, uh, they set up an organisation called the National Institute for Clinical Excellence to give a strong lead on both clinical effectiveness and, very importantly, clinical cost effectiveness. And initially it got criticised as being a rationing tool for the government, but actually I think it's become an incredibly well organised machine to provide evidence-based recommendations. Um, it, it is directed primarily at England and Wales, but its recommendations are actually almost universal, they're applicable. Um, it's based on the best evidence of what works, developed by independent and unbiased committees of experts and lay representatives. And the recommendations set out the care and services that are suitable for most people with that specific condition. Um, they reckon that roughly a, a recommendation made by uh, NICE should address at least 85% of the people with that condition. Now, one of the remits is how to compare the value of, say, a liver transplant from that of having a cataract operation. And it is very difficult to do that. But what they've done is come up with this concept of quality adjusted life year. And basically, a quality adjusted life year of one year is equal to one year in perfect health. And the way you calculate qualities is by estimating the years of life remaining for a patient and waiting each year with a quality of life score uh, from naught to one. I'll give you an example in a second. And essentially NICE reckons that a quality of one, uh, it is a one year is worth 20,000 pounds. So here's an example. This is a person who has a chronic condition, expected to live five years, but the lit condition is reducing his quality of life to half that of somebody in full health. So he has 2.5 qualities. A new treatment comes along that doesn't increase his life expectancy, but does improve his quality of life to three quarters of that with somebody in full health. So he's now potentially a treatment benefit of 1.25 qualities, and NICE would now consider paying for that new treatment if it costs less than 25,000 pounds, because that's 20,000 times that 1.25. When you develop, when they develop guidelines, uh, and it is important to develop guidelines properly, um, you have to have a topic, what is it, in this case, it would be cataracts, for example, the scope, is it all cataracts or just adult cataracts? 
Is it in the primary setting or in the hospital setting? And then most importantly, you've got to define the questions. Guidelines are not textbooks, they are specific questions. What is the best way of doing this? How should we do that? Once those questions are defined, the, the stakeholders are invited to comment on the questions. Then you go away and actually do the literature search against those questions, do the analysis, draft recommendations, and then make uh, a further consultation before it's finally published. And the average time is around about two and a half to three years, and the average cost is at least a quarter million pounds. And this is why having NICE do this means that uh, you get quality uh, recommendations and a quality guideline. So I was directly involved as chair of the cataract guideline. It made 55 recommendations using terms like offer, consider, and you must. Um, offer means you really should do this. Consider means there is limited evidence that it might be of use, um, but you, on balance, that's what you should, probably should do. And we very rarely put you must, unless there's a legal obligation to do so. It also made 17 research recommendations. And of all the recommendations, I'm particularly proud of this one. Recommendation seven, do not restrict access to cataract surgery on the basis of visual acuity. And at the time that we were doing this, there was a significant postcode lottery. Some local areas saying you had to have 618, 624, you can have one eye done, you can have two eyes done. There was such a variation that in fact, the Minister of Health said we had to expedite this in order to, to get rid of that postcode lottery as it was called. And the, basically, that recommendation was based on a very detailed economic analysis modelling the cost of first eye and second eye, immediate surgery, delayed surgery and no surgery. And essentially what they found was, in essence, if you've got a cataract in either eye, if your quality of life is being restricted, there is no justification, financial justification, not to have it done because it is always cheaper in the long run for the NHS to, to allow you to have your operation when you want it at your level of quality of, of a vision. In fact, so good is it, you could justify first eye surgery on a 90 year old with 6'4 vision in both eyes. That's how cost effective cataract surgery is. More recently, we've been working on an update to the glaucoma guideline, and I just draw your attention to what may have a big impact around the world, which is basically NICE are now saying offer SLT surgery as a first line treatment for both ocular hypertension and newly diagnosed chronic open angle glaucoma. Finally, I'm going to change tack and talk about some epidemiology aspects that have been a learning curve for me. And I'm just going to illustrate this with the management of optic neuritis and how it uh, changes across the world. So in the UK, most people with optic neuritis as adults do not require any investigation or treatment. And the justification for that statement comes from the optic neuritis treatment trial uh, based in the States. And if you remember, they randomized patients to intravenous, then oral steroids, oral steroids and placebo. And their inclusion criteria basically was saying, if you thought somebody's got optic neuritis, they were in the trial. They did exclude people who had a systemic condition other than multiple sclerosis that might cause optic neuritis, but essentially it was, if you think somebody's got optic neuritis, they can be included. And what the summary of their finding was that you did not need to investigate them to establish the, the fact that they had optic neuritis or caused the optic neuritis, but you may want to do an MRI scan for assessment of their multiple sclerosis risk. It also found that you did not need to treat their optic neuritis but you may wish to give them methylprednisolone to delay the onset of the multiple sclerosis. So in the United Kingdom, most clinicians have this concept of typical optic neuritis where a patient between 60 and 45 with unilateral uh, gradually progressive visual loss over a few days that has pain on eye movement and a relative atrium pupil defect in an otherwise well, does not need any investigation to establish the cause, um, should be monitored up with a provisional diagnosis until they start to recover spontaneously, at which point the diagnosis is confirmed. And we have the vast majority of the typical, but we recognize as an atypical group where they need to be urgently investigated and urgently treatment to improve their prognosis. And we recognize that there are other causes of optic neuritis, including neuromyelitis optica and anti-MOG, sarcoid, et cetera. And those patients where we think they're atypical, they get a battery of investigations, including anti-aquaporin-4 and anti-MOG these days, and they get a trial of treatment, 
and if they uh, respond well, they will be on longer term treatment with oral steroids. And if they don't respond well, but they are thought to have an inflammatory optic neuropathy, they will have plasma exchange and then they will move on to disease specific long term treatment. Now, the reason we get away with this in the United Kingdom is very simple. It's the contrasting the prevalence of diseases and multiple sclerosis, the underlying cause of vast majority of typical optic neuritis in the United Kingdom, in the United States, is related to multiple sclerosis, where the population prevalence uh, is over 100,000, 100 per 100,000. By contrast, in uh, tropics in, in, in India, in the Far East, this is considerably less. In contrast to MS, NMO prevalence is roughly either somewhere around one to four per hundred foot thousand, and the geographical variation is a lot less. And what that means is in Italy, probably similar in the United Kingdom, the chances of you having NMO as the underlying cause of your optic neuritis is only about one and a half percent. It rises to at least nine percent in India and in East Asia up to 50, up to nearly 50 percent. And therefore, the actual le lesson we should be giving is the management of optic neuritis should be guided by the pretest probability of the underlying condition being present. So in the United Kingdom, the high likelihood of MS related demyelination as a cause means you're likely to have around about 90% as typical, probably another 9%, something I'm just estimating, will have an atypical presentation of typical optic neuritis, perhaps they didn't have pain on eye movement, and then the rest will be other optic neuritis. But in other areas of the world, the prevalence of MS is much less, and therefore I would say in those areas of the world, all cases require urgent investigation and trial treatment. And for me, one of the things that I need to bear in mind in future is that textbooks should take more notice of re regional variations in disease prevalence in order to make sure we're teaching appropriately for the population, uh, the, uh, the, the doctors that we're teaching. Now, I'm going to stop share. And hopefully after my slight debacle, we have Susan Mullen available to uh, do our last talk. Susie, are you there? Thank you, Mike. I am indeed. I'll just get up my slides. So it's been a fantastic showcase um, of what uh, work is going on in the United Kingdom. And what I want to bring to you today is some of the work we're doing in Birmingham on idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Um, I do have some disclosures. Uh, with Invex Therapeutics, which is a spin-out company of the University of Birmingham, uh, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later. So in Birmingham, we've got a transnational research, uh, 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 our brain research portfolio, looking at pathological mechanisms and lawful therapies. But really importantly, what we've been talking about today is quality and equality in clinical care. An idiopathic intracranial hypertension uh, is a disease well known to many ophthalmologists and neurologists. It has very specific diagnostic criteria that must include papilledema, normal neuroimaging, and a raised uh, lumbar puncture opening pressure. And our patients can have really disabling headaches. They're at risk of visual loss. It's a challenging disease because 90% of our patients, it's associated with being overweight or having obesity. It's a disease of social deprivation. And we're now finding uh, this uh, metabolic dysregulation and an increased cardiovascular risk. And it was through this uh, national network um, of primary care database in the UK, we were able to see that the prevalence and incidence of the disease is increasing. And really around about a BMI of 30, um, the, the disease really starts to take off. But what was unique about this um, study was it showed that our patients with IIH that were matched to age, gender and body mass uh, to control patients, we saw this real increased cardiovascular risk that is not explained by obesity alone. And we know from the literature, causes of IIH and has, has been uh, elusive for a long period of time. And we believe it's a disease of over-secretion. And through some of our work in Birmingham, we've now found uh, a real metabolic disease that really determines uh, from your gut neuropeptide uh, axis. Our patients are insulin resistant uh, and they have increased abdominal obesity. 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a bariatric surgery trial that we've done. Um, and one of the sort of starters for that is that we know that it's linked uh, to weight gain. And we know that weight loss methods can be quite challenging, particularly diets uh, can be unsustained. And we know that if you diet, you often put on the weight uh, that you've lost within about two years. So weight gain has also been associated with uh, relapses of disease. And when we asked our patients in a formal priority uh, setting, uh, they emphasized the real importance of finding out what's the most effective approach uh, to treating idiopathic intracranial hypertension. We hypothesized that bariatric surgery would lead to uh, greater weight loss and greater sustained weight loss. So it's a multi-center randomized controlled trial. We recruited women with active idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and they needed to have a body mass index over 35. And the reason for this is that um, in the United Kingdom, people are eligible uh, to have bariatric surgery if their body mass index is over 50. But if they have a comorbidity such as diabetes, they could be eligible at a level a level of 35. Now, idiopathic intracranial hypertension currently isn't a comorbidity. Uh, we used the diagnostic criteria, and these were active patients, although they had a long disease duration of over one year. And we were quite pragmatic about our approach. It was a shared care decision as to what type of surgery the patients had. So some had a gastric band, some had rion y and some had a sleeve. Um, and the dietary intervention was Weight Watchers. The primary outcome was lumbar puncture as measured by lumbar puncture opening pressure, but we had all the visual secondaries and quality of life measures. The sample size we looked at uh, was uh, to detect a dis difference of five centimeters of CSF uh, between the treatment arms. Uh, we knew that we would have a withdrawal rate. So based on these assumptions, we recruited 66 women. The primary analysis, which I'll show you first, is intention to treat. So those patients that were randomized uh, to a specific group. We also planned a per protocol analysis because we knew that there would be slight movement between the two groups. So we randomized 66 women, and actually it was a very popular study to recruit to. And the mean uh, uh, sort of uh, baseline characteristics were that of a really typical IIH population. Uh, they had a good going into cranial pressure at 35 centimeters of CSF uh, and with evident papilledema. And this is the intention to treat, which shows that we saw a difference of six centimeters of CSF uh, at 12 months uh, between the surgery and uh, the diet. And when we look between uh, baseline and 12 months, you can see that the bariatric surgery uh, group lost nearly nine centimeters of CSF. And again, these were sustained out to 24 months. In fact, we saw a further reduction in ICP over the next 12 months. And these were nicely mirrored by uh, the weight change and body mass index and reduction in excessive body weight. And so here we can see quite nicely the percentage weight change uh, of uh, the diet versus the surgery. Uh, and again, the percentage intracranial pressure change. And what we find really interesting, which has not been seen in the literature before, was we were able to correlate headache uh, severity with intracranial pressure. And not only that, we were able to predict uh, what the change in intracranial pressure would be uh, looking at the change in headache severity and monthly headache days. This also correlated nicely with quality of life measures. So next, we're going to move to the per protocol analysis. And this is important because we wanted to really explore the differences between intracranial pressure, weight loss, and also the weight loss methods. And here we use a linear high regression uh, model. So again, just to remind ourselves, these are, these are where the patients are. And when we move through, you can see the differences between banding, sleeve and bypass, with Rue on Y-pass being far superior over the other uh, modalities of uh, surgery. And again, this is mirrored in the percentage uh, change in intracranial pressure. And there was a really nice tight relationship at 12 months between body weight and change in intracranial pressure. 
And again, we saw this at 24 months. And so often when I'm asked in clinic, a patient will say to me, well, how much weight do I need to lose? And when we looked in the literature, it's between three and uh, 15%. But actually, when we started to really work on the data, we find that actually patients needed to lose at least 24% of their body weight to get below the threshold of a lumbar puncture opening pressure of 25. And that's what we defined as disease remission. And again, when we look at these changes in body weight, you typically need to be allocated to the bariatric surgery arm uh, for you to achieve uh, that uh, level of intracranial pressure. Now, the study was really well tolerated. Most of the uh, adverse events were in the placebo arm, were usually by exacerbation of the IIH. We had no patients undergoing emergency surgery. We had one uh, event in one of our uh, bariatric surgery patients who had a mesenteric stitch uh, that was sorted within 24 hours with them being uh, admitted uh, with a diagnostic laparoscopy, and there was no deaths within the group. And so bariatric surgery arm among patients with active IIH has really favorable outcomes. It has sustainable outcomes in terms of intracranial pressure, disease remission, and also quality of life measures. And this level that we, we have now determined is quite surprising. Those patients with a higher starting weight typically need to lose more weight to put their disease into remission. And I just wanted to highlight in the last few minutes um, some of the sub studies that we did. One of the sub studies looked at the impact of intracranial pressure on cognition. And this has long been debated uh, in the literature as not uh, uh, that we we could, we've detected cognitive problems, but they have not been reversible. And how does that affect our clinical measurements? And so here uh, we uh, were able to recruit uh, uh, 25 control patients uh, who were matched for age, uh, gender uh, and body mass uh, index. And they kindly underwent the same baseline investigations, including lumbar puncture, um, so that we could assess a number of different things. And using a bespoke battery, we really were looking at attention and working memory and executive function and short term memory. And what we saw was uh, acutely post lumbar puncture that there's an improvement uh, in patients with IIH with attention uh, and also executive function and over 12 months as the ICP improves you get improvement in verbal short-term memory. There were many factors as we would expect in this disease that uh, affect cognition including uh, some of the comorbidities we see with IIH but what was really important to us was this uh, ability to perform a visual field uh, and this was measured by the false positives uh, false negatives visual field index and test duration so we really have to be thoughtful with our patients uh, when we're putting them through multiple tests particularly when the disease is very active now, within my title, I had uh, per Ardu ad Astra through hardship to, through the stars. And some of you may know that idiopathic intracranial hypertension shares some similar features uh, to what astronauts get when they get uh, optic nerve uh, edema. And while um, our astronauts are a population that are not overweight and obese, that also mirrors some of our patients in clinic. About 10% of my patients in clinic are not overweight and obese. So while uh, the IH weight study and bariatric surgery was very successful here, we've got to be able to do better. And what I wanted to show you is some of the uh, uh, new work that we're bringing through from the lab. We've been able to identify uh, GLP-1 uh, receptors within the choroid plexus. We know that uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists are treated, are used to treat diabetes since 2005 and are incredibly well tolerated. We were able to show in animal experiments uh, um, excellent uh, intracranial pressure reduction, uh, particularly when you compare them to things like topiramate, diamox, uh, spironolactone, and there's a really good dosing response. And we've been able to move this uh, through to a phase two study. And this phase two study is really nice because what we're doing is we're using really high fidelity intracranial pressure monitors uh, that uh, sit within the right frontal uh, lobe. Uh, it's a 10 minute procedure and it 
gives us highly accurate intracranial pressure monitoring. And this phase two has showed that we have really fantastic reductions uh, in intracranial pressure, not only at uh, two and a half hours, 24 hours, but all the way out to 12 weeks. So we're very excited to be bringing a phase three randomized controlled trial uh, 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 to the UK and hopefully worldwide. And I just want to finish by um, thanking uh, my wonderful colleague, uh, Professor Alex Sinclair, uh, who is a, a clinical uh, scientist, and also all the clinical team uh, at University Hospitals Birmingham who helped deliver the work and all the academics within the programme. I'd like to take any questions. Thanks very much, Susie. If you can uh, stop sharing, that would be brilliant. Although, yes, that was a very good quick advert for UNOS in June. Um, I would also like to say congratulations in public to you on becoming a professor yourself in the uh, last, what, few weeks? Is it sinking in properly now? Yes, yeah, not I really. Think at this, <laughs> <laughs> I still, um, I would still, I, I'd like to suggest now that I pass, hand over to the moderators uh, and have all the panel available to answer questions that they may feed us. And whilst they're doing that, I was going to ask Will Dean something. If, um, can you hear me, Will? I certainly can, Mike, yes. OK, so my question for you was, how much does it cost to set up a surgical simulation system that would be of benefit in training our future ophthalmologists? So thanks, Mike. I, th I think that's a really important uh, question. And I, I think about uh, $25,000 US would fund a full digital dry lab with the capabilities of uh, having, having desktop microscopes, but linked up to a recording system and recording iPads. So for four or five station digital dry lab, about 25,000 US dollars, which is not a huge amount of money uh, when considering the impact of, of that training. Thank you very much. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Michael, there is one question in the Q&A section from okay. Dr. Roy. With the uh, NICE recommending recently that SLT laser should be offered first line for OHT and early glaucoma patients in the UK, how is it going to affect or change the delivery of glaucoma care, particularly in a community-based setting? I think that's for Dr. Jairam. Yeah, so I, I think that's a that's a very good very good point, especially you know on the basis of the findings of the light trial. Um, now, community-based care is currently a topic of discussion and how we've modeled this in the UK. So I, I, I don't know what the, what the actual answer is to that. What I can say is from um, what I personally would advocate is that you know, in, in my ideal world, if I could create it, I would have um, all glaucoma care in the community ultimately being under, under the oversight of hospital-based specialists um, just for governance, quality control, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we are certainly, you know, certainly at Moorfields over the past three, four years, we've increased our sort of capacity for SLT laser slots. We are also, there's also a lot of research going on into the delivery of SLT is, is not just given by doctors, but given by specialist optometrists um, as well. Um, and that's something that we are expanding um, at the moment. It may well be once the UK has decided how it wants to manage its community pathways, um, it may well be that community optometrists will be trained in a hospital setting to, 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 to give the, the SLT treatments if needed. Um, and, but I think that's something for the future. Could I, could I make a comment on that as well as part of the team that came up with that guideline? Um, it, it nice recognise that it takes time to implement the change that they, they're recommending. So no guideline is implemented tomorrow. Um, so I think the uptake in SLT will be gradual, depending on local resources. But I absolutely fully endorse your concept of we have a community based service, but uh, it is it is uh, governed and, uh, and supervised by the hospital clinicians. Uh, who have the confidence that that particular person delivering that aspect of the service has the competency to do the job. So I think governance of and the data handling and control has got to remain within the hospital setting and the consultants that deliver the service. And Mike, just one other thing to add in there is um, 
on a on a practical level, yes, we may well recommend um, laser ahead of eye drops as an as an initial treatment to our patients. What you find is that's not necessarily what patients will agree to because um, we have a lot of patients who the word laser, you know, instigates fear and yeah. terror in them. So there are many patients who actually say, "Look, I'd rather have an eye drop." Um, so, yeah. so that that's another point to t- uh, to to think about. the the other The other thing is, you know, in terms of the the guidance um, that's come out, it's it's saying, you know, we would offer, you know, offer offer treatment for those pressure those with a pressure above um, twenty four millimeters of mercury. You know, I've, I'm a, I've quite often spoken about how I feel that I think we over treat. Uh, patients within the UK, whether it's with drops or or laser, yeah. um, and you know, I certainly I would have no qualms in monitoring a patient with with pressures in their high twenties if there was no yeah. evidence of of optic nerve change or visual field change, especially yeah, so when that, you look at you know, especially when you look at the data from the Oates trial, um, you know, the, the risk of developing glaucoma in untreated patients is incredibly low. Yeah, well, that that was part of the the guideline. The full recommendation is if they are at risk and that determining yeah. whether they truly at risk. So this is the ocular hypertension groups, a uh, recommendation of treatment over 25, if at, over 24, if at risk. And determining that risk is one of those nuances that a consultant ophthalmologist uh, or trained uh, person really needs to, 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 to take account of. Um, but obviously once they've got evidence of nerve damage field loss, they are at risk. And at that point, the threshold for, for pressure doesn't, it, it disappears. So, yeah. Um, can I, unless somebody else is aware of a question, ask... Oh, sorry, Chatra. Yep. Yes, you, uh, yep. thank All you, right. Mr. Berlin. Uh, you had a fantastic talk. I really liked how you have uh, in so detailed, uh, you know, gone into the audit of all the processes. I think it's rather tough in our country because we don't have access to as much data. We don't, uh, you know, put in our uh, data so in, in an organized manner to actually go back and audit it. So lots to learn there. Uh, uh, as far as uh, Mr. Dean's uh, talk went uh, with regard to simulation, a lot was spoken on cataract and glaucoma. So I am basically a VR surgeon and we have a simulator called as a VR magic at our center. Uh, it is horrendously expensive, but we did manage to get it. And uh, uh, the unfortunate thing is the updates itself, again, are very, very expensive. So for every new module for training, uh, it, it's definitely very, very expensive. As regards uh, uh, for uh, the you know use of the training, we've not done any formal studies, but what we've noticed is uh, the ambidextrousness of uh, the uh, surgeon definitely increases, especially with respect to VR surgery. Most of us are right-handed and we don't tend to use it, but uh, as, you can, as you're very well aware, for vitrectomies at least, we do need uh, uh, the other hand as well for a good vitrectomy and for base shaving, etc. I also found that, uh, you know, when I go with my fellows, I also try to do it. It's not easy, though it gives you a good score. You need to be extremely fine. You know, the the minute you go close to the retina, it gives you a poor score and says poor tissue handling. So it's it's not easy. So it does make them, uh, you know, very fine in their movements. Their depth perception is definitely increased. So I think it's fantastic. Uh, At least the larger institutes uh, do have it here. So I think it's a good way. And I'm more comfortable since you put up that question, you know, which person would you rather give your, uh, you know, uh, patient to be operated on? I would rather give it to somebody who has done some hours of, uh, you know, simulation uh, training as well. And uh, Mr. Shah's uh, talk was fantastic. I never looked at it that way. I never thought of it as, you know, a specialization in doing just one eye uh, surgeries. I don't know if he's around. But um, I wanted to definitely ask him what are his thoughts on VR surgeries because we are not only, uh, you know, uh, operating on one-eyed patients or one-eyed patients, we are working on half-eye, if you may, because your vision in that eye also is so poorly compromised, ischemic, uh, you know, retinas. So I I am fearful to operate on these patients. And chair time definitely is long because we have to explain that, you know, even the limited vision that they have, could be lost due to post-operative glaucoma and uh, non-perfusion. So, I mean, I don't know if you have any thoughts on um, VR surgeries because that's what, uh, uh, you know, we do quite a lot in our department. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, you can imagine in glaucoma, we're used to this concept of half and only eye. Um, I think my main advice as regards VR surgery, would it's like you said, it's, it's all about chair time and 
methodically going through each of the uh, elements. But I think from my own personal experience, pressure spikes after VR surgery are a very big problem. And I think maybe sometimes, especially on only eyes, we should be measuring the pressure four hours, maybe sometimes eight hours after surgery um, and making sure they don't get a pressure spike and doing everything possible using gutty apiclonidine 1%, Diamox and other things. Because if you're looking at wipeouts, um, pressure spikes are probably your number one cause in VR. Peter, can I make a comment there? Uh, again, I'm going to quote you. Um, the concept of reluctance to operate. And uh, I think it ties in with a bit of what I've been saying and certainly a lot about what Will has been saying. Um, and there are certain conditions of which glaucoma is a pr probably one of the primary examples and perhaps VR surgery is one where there is reluctance of the surgeon, perhaps not very uh, skilled at doing it, to actually do the operation that's needed. And I think one of the things we must have is clinicians who know when to operate as well as how to operate and have the confidence in their surgery when they do. Do you want to comment? Mike, uh, Mike I think that's absolutely right. I think reluctance to operate is a, is a major problem in the UK, certainly in glaucoma. And I think failure to rescue when things go wrong. And so I think reluctance to operate, we should be able to get around that through MDT type scenarios for listing patients. But failure to rescue is very much about the post-operative course, about identifying people who are deprived, people who can't come back and get lost to follow up, people who can't afford the drops, people who can't put the drops in, um, people who, if they don't go back to work quickly, lose their job, especially young people with only eye surgery. So I think failure to rescue is an area where we could rescue a lot of eyes that were going to be lost. Mr. Shah, I have one more question. Uh, do you uh, believe in uh, getting your patients to get a second opinion? So what we do when we are not very sure about the outcomes, just for the patient to have a better understanding, we do tend to send our patients out for a second opinion uh, before they undergo surgery in their only eye where the prognosis is not very great. So do you have that uh, system as well or uh, are you the second opinion for most times? So I, I agree with you fully. And in fact, I, I was thinking that somebody might ask me a question about, you know, do you stop warfarin in, in only eye surgery, for example? And, and my, my answer would have been, and it's the same answer to your question really, which is you need a patient-centered approach and you need a multidisciplinary team decision. So with at least one other ophthalmologist, maybe the cardiologist, the stroke physician, or the hematologist, they may have relevant things, the anesthetist, and finally, a holistic approach to risk stratification. So, you know, not just drugs such as warfarin and NOAX, but things like ginkgo omega-3, which affect bleeding, platelets, cardiovascular things like blood pressure, tachycardia, anxiety, and then all the ophthalmic risk factors. So in answer to your question, I would never be isolated alone, listing or doing an only eye patient. I would always have colleagues. Great, thank you. We have one more audience question uh, from Dr. Samar Tagarwal. How much do you think are virtual clinics in UK helping in curing the post pandemic backlog? And how useful are they for training fellows in retina or glaucoma? So I think just to the first part of the question, in terms of clearing the post-pandemic backlog, I think from our experience at Moorfields, if we didn't have the diagnostic hubs we have now, we would be sinking. You know, we just wouldn't be able to, um, you know, get through the work. You know, ultimately, you know, the, the rate of discharge for, of glaucoma patients is very low. Um, and it's about maintaining timely follow-up. And I, I think... Um, Without the diagnostic hubs, we certainly wouldn't wouldn't be able to cope at the moment. The other the other bonus that bonus of the diagnostic hubs that I didn't really allude to is that they actually liberate capacity on traditional hospital sites. So one of the um, one of the the major conditions that was pushed to the back back, back burner during the pandemic was cataract surgery. Um, and you know, there's a huge there, there, you know certainly in the London region, there's a huge backlog. Um, for cataracts um, and, and certainly this I think this is reflective across the whole country as well so one of the advantages of us essentially creating diagnostic hubs outside of traditional NHS estates is that we're able to see 
um, a lot more of these patients who are requiring cataract surgery um, and you know helping other other patients who wouldn't be seen. So it's it's sort of a it has an additional bonus other than the, the specialty which we're um, we're uh, trying to look after. The second part of the question was related to training, I think, wasn't it? So um, how useful are they for training fellows in retina and, and glaucoma care? Now, the way that we structure things at the moment is, so with, with during the pandemic, it was predominantly consultant led. Um, now what we are trying to do is we realize that for our fellows coming through, um, you know, learning how to run a diagnostic or virtual review service, how to manage it and how to monitor it and audit it and, and, and maintain its quality control is really important. So we have what we call buddied sessions now with where we'll have consultants and fellows who are re reviewing patients together. Now, this may not be physically in the same site, but they may be patient lists. And, you know, with social media, WhatsApp, telephone, there is always a, a discussion um, about cases, about, you know, management and, and how to proceed. And I, I think, um, I actually think it's a very useful exercise in, in trying to sort of dissect the decision-making process for um, managing cases, certainly from a, from a glaucoma perspective. You know, you really get to understand um, you know, the detailed interpretation of OCT images, fields, progression analyses, um, you know, what, 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 is, what is a genuine risk and what requires treatment escalation. And I, I think it's, a, I think, I think it, it's a, been a valuable exercise. Certainly that's the feedback we've had from our fellows and also from our specialist optometrists who are being trained in a, in a similar manner also. Um, but I don't know whether what, what the other, other, people, other panelists' views are on that. No, I, I think... Uh, to me, uh, one of the concerns I've always had in the training of, of junior doctors is the tendency over the last 20 to 30 years of removing decision making away from the junior to the consultant. And one of the concerns I had there is that we end up with a cohort of new consultants who's never really actually had to make a decision throughout the whole of their training. And now they've been asked to make all the decisions. So providing opportunities where they are actually making the decisions and having to think about why they're making them is, is, is to me, excellent. Um, can I ask Susie something? Are you there, Susie? I am indeed. Yes. Um, am I going to have to call you Prof now instead of Susie? It's no. Going, that's not the question. <laughs> so the question I have for you, now you've shown the success of bariatric surgery as a treatment for IH, are you offering it to all patients or selected patients? And if so, how are so, you selecting um, so that, that, that is a fantastic question, because at the moment we're working with NICE actually to see whether we can get uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension listed as a comorbidity. And we'll hopefully know at the end of summer whether that's available. Now, the difficulty is, is about a quality of care. And you alluded it to it earlier about postcode lottery comorbidities uh, within the bariatric surgery pathway are optional uh, for the unit delivering bariatric surgery. So depending on what their backlogs are, they may decide not to offer it to anybody uh, below uh, a body mass index of 50. Now, the other side of it is, is that we've now got an increase in weight management clinics that are run by endocrinologists. And we've just recently had uh, Saxenda uh, funded in, in the United Kingdom. So for my patients that are between uh, a body mass index of 30, probably to about 45, we're routinely offering them um, a, a referral. Now, it, it's a really highly sensitive area, as you know, Mike. I mean, you've worked with these patients over, over many years. So so it's a delicate conversation about asking their permission, one, to talk about weight uh, and obesity, and, and number two, as to whether they actually want active management for it. Thank you very much. Um, is anybody aware of any other questions for any other panellists? As I run out. Peter's got his hand up, I think. Oh, Peter? Peter. Yeah, no, I just, um, just got a couple of questions. So first of all, I just wanted to commend Harry on his work. I think it's absolutely amazing what you're doing. And to, I mean, I've always been a diehard face-to-face -face clinician, but I have to admit this move to virtual, um, there's one thing that changes, that you don't multitask anymore. You know, you're much better quality of decision-making when you're doing virtual. And I think that translates through into potentially better training, Harry. So I just thought that was, that was brilliant. And uh, then I just wanted to also just say I was blown away by uh, Will's talk as well. And uh, Will, I think 
one of the main things is to uh, not just dissect and deconstruct, but to micro dissect and micro deconstruct. And yeah. to what extent do you think that um, electronic based, web based video material of expert surgeons and exemplar surgeons breaking down operations can feed into the model that you've got? Oh, thanks, Peter. No, you, no, that's that's really, really important to. Uh, yes, as you say, deconstruct um, the procedure. And we, we did a, a subgroup analysis within the GLASS trial, um, looking at which particular steps of trabeculectomy were sort of improved most by intense uh, simulation uh, training. And uh, yet not completely agree to even more micro dissect, even major steps of a trabeculectomy procedure into even smaller components and um, the the instruction needn't necessarily be in person as we as we demonstrated with the trab lab the the remote satellite hub and satellite approach that we had at the royal college um, la a couple of weeks ago so having really well designed uh, educationally impactful uh, videos with it you know instruction on 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 micro steps of a very tricky procedure available online i, th I think it's, a, it's an excellent excellent way forward. Has anybody else got any questions? Because well, I think we are coming up to the end of our session. Is that correct? We, um, yes, um, Mr. Yeah. I think we've answered all the audience questions as well. Yes, we have already answered all the questions and we still have uh, nine minutes. Well, in that case, can I can I throw out a slightly controversial question, perhaps to Peter, because I know he's thought about this long and hard, and to Will as well. With all your surgical training experience and reflections on, on training, what makes a good surgeon? Can you summarise what <laughs> makes a good surgeon? I've got my own ideas, but I'll, I'll tell you at the end. Uh, that's a great question, Mike. Um, <laughs> may I, maybe I'll start with um, it takes a lifetime and you have to start early. Um, you have to care and you have to be brave and want to take on responsibility and almost continuously be able to work with uncertainty and be outside of your comfort zone. And you mesh those features with what I call the three T's that came out of our research into ethnicity, time, team and trust. And, and of those probably building trust with your patients is the most important. But Mike, I'd very much welcome your thoughts as well. Well, I was going to get Will to have a go next. Um, <laughs> thanks, Mike. I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crucial question. And, and um, Ericsson famously came up with the uh, concept of expertise and 10,000 hours of practice needed uh, to become an expert in glaucoma surgery, in, in cataract surgery. Um, and so, yes, a practice and practice at your zone of proximal development, sort of pushing yourself uh, constantly. But um, I did a lot of um, qualitative work within the Glass and Olympics trials, and we, we did a lot of um, in-depth interviews, which we uh, transcribed and thematized. And um, uh, motivation is, is also key. You have to want to be a better surgeon. Uh, constantly, and that that deeply ingrained internal motivation, I think, is 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 critical. And so, my observations are entirely in line with yours. Uh, I think uh, respect for your patient is is a starting yeah. point for a good surgeon. But just one of the practical things that I've observed is I have seen surgeons who can do really good cataract surgery if everything's going well but they somehow unable to separate between what they think is going on and what's actually going on. And to me, the, some of the best surgeons are those who are actually monitoring what's actually happening as they go on so that they spot where it's not quite right at that stage and you need to go back to, rather than assuming you finish that step and going on. So that's, that's my final observation on what you two have already said. Um, thanks. Mike, could I, um, could I just yep. listening to Will there talking about uh, Anders Ericsson and Anders Ericsson uses the term deliberate practice, which I, I like, but I don't, I don't love it. I, I like the term intentional practice. And I yes. think when you deconstruct things, one of the key things is that intention drives action. And without that intent, you just can't flow through surgery. 
whether you're in a difficult position, Mike, as you say, or in a routine. And I think this, this, this ability to have intent behind every movement and every decision is critical. And that comes from um, having great mentors and watching a lot of good surgery, I think. Yeah, I, I entirely agree. I think unless any of our Indian colleagues have got any final questions, um, I personally would like to thank all the speakers. I think they've been excellent talks. I'd like to thank them for giving up their, their Sunday uh, afternoon to be to, to, to be with uh, you on this on this conference. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. So um, thank you very much. All right, even I would like to take this opportunity to thank our chairperson, Dr. Michael, to chair the session. I would like to thank our moderators, Dr. Chaitra and Dr. Amar Pujari. I would also like to thank all our speakers for being here on the virtual dais. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us. Namaste. And before we all part our ways from here, uh, can I have you looking at the screen with a good smile? We'll have a lovely picture being taken. Atul, can you please take a picture? Can you do the needful? Atul, picture has been taken. I'm sure, I am sure Atul must have taken a picture. Atul, picture, Lily, you have All right, yeah. Done. So, thank you so much for being on the virtual live. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Very much. Good evening. Thank you. All right, so we, have, we do have the participants uh, already here with us for the upcoming session. So I would just like to acknowledge the presence of our chairperson, Dr. Carol Shields. Dr. Carol, uh, good evening, welcome, and namaste on the virtual dice here. Our co-chairperson, Dr. Martin, the convener for the upcoming session, Dr. Arun Singh, the co-convener, Dr. Mary, moderator for the upcoming session, Dr. Bhavna Chavla, and uh, the panelists, Dr. Mili, Dr. Mahesh, Dr. Swathi, Dr. Vila, uh, Vikas, Dr. Ferus, Dr. Kasturi. We have Dr. Puk, uh, Pukharaj, Dr. Vishal, Dr. Usha, Dr. Rajendra, Dr. Subina, Dr. Santosh, and Dr. Usha Singh. So uh, these are our panelists. We still have some time before we start with this upcoming session. And the first uh, presentation is going to be done by Dr. Uh, Carol Shields. So Dr. Carol, before we start with our presentation, would you like to share your screen and check whether the presentations are running? Follow sure. with Dr. Uh, Martin. Can you see that? Yes, okay. Yes. And can... I just want to make sure it moves. It moved? Yes, it did. It, it did. did. It did. Move. Yes. Good. Thank you. That's all, all right. I need. <laughs> Dr. Martin, would you like to uh, check uh, your presentation, sir? Yes. Share screen. There we go. Share. And I go to. You can we can see it. Oh, yeah. yes, we can. Yes. One. So Good. now you should see my whole screen, correct? Yes. 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 Screen. Good. Like the slide. And I can go forward. Yes. Followed with Dr. Arun Singh. Dr. Arun, would you like to share the screen? Dr. Martin, you can stop sharing the screen now. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Dr. Arun, would you like to share the screen? Yes. Let me... Please share your screen so we can check. Yeah. Followed with uh, Dr. Mary. How's that? Is it okay? All right, Dr. Arun. Yes, absolutely perfect. You can okay. stop sharing the screen now. Dr. Mary. 
Is Dr. Mary here with us? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Mary, would you like to share your screen, please? All right, we can see that. And Dr. Bhavna Chavla. Thank you, Dr. Mary. You can stop sharing your screen. Dr. Bhavna Chavla. Yeah. Mine is working. Would you like to share? No problem. Yeah. I checked mine okay. already. Yeah. Great. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Hello. Everyone. Hi. Good Hi. evening, Dr. Fair. Namaste. Welcome. Hi, Mr. Hime. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah. All right. So with your uh, permission, I would like to officially uh, start with this session. So ladies and gentlemen, I welcome everybody to IOC 2022. And um, we have our chairperson, Dr. Carol Shields uh, there with us. So I would like to hand over the virtual dais to our chairperson and then she can take it forward from here. Thank you. Welcome and namaste. Yeah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Uh, this is going to be a symposium in ocular oncology, uh, intraocular tumors, and uh, I, I'm graced to be the first speaker, so I will share my screen. So by the time you are sharing your screen, Dr. Carol, we have 15 minutes of presentation time for every speaker. And so yeah. Towards the end, we will uh, utilize the time for discussions if it's okay with everybody. You can continue, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. And you can see my slides? Yes, we can see your slide and we can hear you loud and clear. Good to go. Okay, good. Okay, so I have no financial interest or relationships to disclose. And I'd like to speak to you on uh, retinoblastoma, global retinoblastoma 2023. It takes an entire team to evaluate a patient and manage a patient with retinoblastoma. And in our practice, I always say it takes a village to manage a child with retinoblastoma. And we've been doing this for over 50 years at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. So global retinoblastoma. In 2009, Cavella wrote a very nice report on the challenge of the most frequent eye cancer, retinoblastoma. And he estimated that there were approximately 8,000 new cases per year on planet Earth. In 2020, Fabian et al. looked at the year 2017 and gathered 4,351 4, new patients with retinoblastoma from 153 countries. This was an enormous amount of work for he and his team. And they found the median age at presentation was 30 months. However, if you look at high income countries only, the median age at presentation was much earlier at 14 months and very few patients had extra scleral extension of retinoblastoma or metastatic disease as compared to low income countries where the median age was much older at 30 months and extra, extra scleral retinoblastoma was seen in up to 50% and metastasis at 19%. And if you look at this in graph form, you'll see median age is very disparate between high and low income countries, extra scleral extension of retinoblastoma nearly 50% in low income countries compared to high income countries and metastatic disease differed uh, based on income per country. Most of this we expect is related to the dramatic delay in diagnosis or presentation in low-income countries because there was a 16-month difference, and that allows for substantial tumor growth and tumor invasion. Then the next study by the same team, Fabian et al., which included many, many people and many of the people in this symposium, will be published in Lancet Global Health this year. Again, they looked at the same, they asked the question, what is the outcome of treatment for children with retinoblastoma around the world? Looking at the same cohort from 2017, 4,351 new patients in 153 countries. Chemotherapy was available in all the countries and he confirmed that. And he found the three-year survival per country for high income was over 99%, mid-high income, 
91%, mid-low income, 80%, and low income, 57%. So with all the improvements that we've made with retinoblastoma and put in perspective, we still have a lot of work to do to help all nations with retinoblastoma improve detection and care. Now, Ancona Lizama from Mexico, along with Lauren Dalvin from Mayo Clinic and our team in Philadelphia wrote an analysis on where we stand with retinoblastoma. This was published in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. And I'll summarize for you, that for you in this presentation. It's all about chemotherapy. Chemotherapy delivered in various ways. So we still perform a nucleation for high risk retinoblastoma or, or if the family is unreliable. We give intravenous chemotherapy for bilateral retinoblastoma. Intraarterial, we still like to reserve for unilateral retinoblastoma. And we inject the vitreous or aqueous with chemotherapy if there is seeding. And plaque radiotherapy is still performed, but if all the above fails, then we go on to plaque radiotherapy. So a few words about intravenous chemotherapy. This treats not only the eyes, but we think it prevents pinealoblastoma and minimizes second cancer. Here you see a child with bilateral advanced retinoblastoma, total retinal detachment, and after intravenous chemotherapy, the retina has flattened, the tumors have regressed, she's now 20 years old, with vision of 2030 OD and 2070 OS, and no metastatic disease. But is this really lasting? Because we're only giving six cycles of chemotherapy? Well, we wanted to answer that question and we published this in BJO 2020, long-term analysis in nearly 1,000 eyes using intravenous chemotherapy for retinoblastoma. And in this analysis, we looked at one, two, three, five, 10, and 20 years follow-up. And here you can see at one year follow-up, over 90% of groups A, B, and C did well. A good amount of group D, 78% had their eye saved without the need for radiotherapy and about 50% of group E. And it held at two years, at three years, at five years, 10, and even 20 years. So I generally tell our patients what we see at two to three years is basically what the child's gonna have long-term. Now, what is the need for additional intraarterial chemotherapy or plaque radiotherapy after intravenous chemotherapy? And we looked at this in the same cohort. We tend to go on to IAC first, and that's at a mean interval of five months as needed, and plaque radiotherapy if IAC fails at a mean interval of 13 months. And we found overall, following intravenous chemotherapy, IAC was necessary 17% of cases, and plaque 19% of cases. So it is a little bit of making judgment on tumor control and knowing what you have available to treat and save the eye. So what about IAC? How successful are we with IAC? Well, it is successful, especially for group DIs, much more successful than intravenous chemotherapy, especially if we can see that there is some normal retina as in this case that showed complete response with just two doses of IAC. So we published last year in the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, our experience with 1,292 infusions of intraarterial chemotherapy for retinoblastoma. Here's one example. In A, you can see the advanced disease with B showing the ultrasound and then following IAC in C, you can see it's beautifully regressed and confirmed in D on ultrasound. So if we look at five-year follow-up of IAC following 1292 infusions, we have 100% globe salvage for group B, 80% group C, 78% group D, and 55% for group E. And in, uh, for primary treatment, 76% uh, of eyes were saved. So three quarters of the eyes we can save with intraarterial chemotherapy using a median of three infusions. And now we've gotten to the point that our complication rate is only 1% per infusion. But honestly, it's not all that easy. This is a nice report from our team, Swide and Jabor, 
where they looked at alternative routes that are essential for delivery of intraarterial chemotherapy. They were successful in accessing the ophthalmic artery in 97% of cases, but in 3% of cases, unsuccessful due to poor vascular access, anaphylactic reaction, carotid vasospasm, or simply just failed to reach the ophthalmic artery. And when they looked at 207 eyes, 658 procedures, you can see 20 of the cases they needed to use the balloon, 22 middle meningeal approach, some technical failures, ophthalmic artery stenosis. There's lots of decisions that go into a single case of intraarterial chemotherapy. Overall, they achieved success in 97% of cases, but needed to use alternative routes in 6% of cases. And the median number of infusions per that team, our team, was three infusions. Some got by with two, and even some got by with only one infusion for tumor control. The team in Buffalo wrote an editorial or commentary on their results. This commentary read, intraarterial chemotherapy has varying, varying efficacy, but it is a medical success story and the value of endovascular expertise at a high volume center is important. This article highlights that and retinoblastoma patients should be served at a center that does have experience with this treatment. I'll move on to intravitreous chemotherapy. This is a very important modality for saving eyes with vitreous seeds. You can see before Intravitreous chemo, intravenous chemotherapy. And then on the bottom, after intravenous chemotherapy, we still have vitreous seeds, but we clean those up with intravitreal chemotherapy. We generally give four injections at a monthly interval. And you can see the macula was fine in this case. We published on our first uh, 192 injections and had 100% vitreous seed control. And then Jasmine Francis. Uh, gathered data from 10 retinoblastoma centers and found there was no case where extraocular retinoblastoma was seen in any of these over 3,000 injections. Now, I'll talk about a very important topic, high-risk retinoblastoma. What is high risk and how do we treat it? Well, let's start with the latter question first. Swathi Kaliki, who is one of the panelists in this session, looked at the value of vincristin, etoposide, and carboplatin for high-risk retinoblastoma and found globe salvage and tumor control, um, found tumor control in every case. These were eyes that had high risk following a nucleation and using those three agents, metastatic disease was prevented in 100% of cases. The more difficult question is, what is high-risk retinoblastoma? Well, 20 years after Swathi did that first report, she published this recent report in JAMA Ophthalmology, where she defined what is high-risk retinoblastoma. She looked at patients from all the different continents, Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, North and South America. 52 oncologists and pathologists were surveyed as to what defines high-risk retinoblastoma. And in this figure, you can see we agree and we don't agree. Here's where we agree. We all agree that post-laminar optic nerve invasion, transection invasion, scleral infiltration, and extra, extra scleral tumor is high risk. And we also agree that massive choroidal invasion is high risk. Where we don't agree is regarding anterior chamber seeds, iris infiltration, ciliary body infiltration, trabecular meshwork invasion, and minor choroidal invasion. In Philadelphia, we believe that optic nerve invasion post-laminar and choroidal invasion more than three millimeters is high risk or any combination of optic nerve or choroidal invasion. So Dr. Kaliki is going on with a multi-center study, which is underway to evaluate how we manage high-risk retinoblastoma. And I'll conclude with the psychology of retinoblastoma. What is it like to have a child with retinoblastoma and how do these children feel? Let's talk about the patient first. 
In the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, this was analyzed in a small cohort of patients, 92 retinoblastoma survivors, looking at four dimensions, physical, emotional, social, and school. And they found that the quality of life of these 92 retinoblastoma survivors was significantly lower compared to sibling controls in all four domains, but particularly in the physical domain and the social domain. And then we looked at, along with Mary Louise Collins, how do the parents feel when they have a family member with retinoblastoma? Well, the majority of parents displayed using standardized testing, some depression, anxiety, and all felt stress. And severe depression was more often found in those who had children with multifocal disease and previous history of depression and less education. So in summary, over the past few minutes, we've talked about global retinoblastoma disparities, the, the magnificent work of Fabian and his team of many, many centers from around the world. We've reviewed chemotherapy for retinoblastoma, high-risk retinoblastoma from the Kaliki et al. studies, and then the psychology of retinoblastoma in parents and patients. So in, this is um, a nice overview uh, from the laser-focused retinoblastoma team in Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. That was an excellent presentation. Any questions for Dr. Shields? Uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, do you treat any patients of group E retinoblastoma now with upfront enucleation? Oh, sure, we do. And when we, in our analyses, when we treat them with intravenous or intraarterial chemotherapy, they are group EIs, but they might not be as highly advanced. So if we have an eye that has endophytic retinoblastoma and the entire eye is filled with tumor, we tend to enucleate. Or if the family is not reliable or there's vitreous hemor hemorrhage or obvious uh, neovascularization in the retina, we will treat iris neovascularization secondary to retinoblastoma with chemotherapy because it will go away. But if there's retinal neovascularization, you're often left with traction detachment and vitreous hemorrhage. Trust me, we've done it, uh, but then you wind up having to enucleate those eyes. So we still perform enucleation. And what about anterior chamber seeds? What's your experience with intracameral chemotherapy? Yeah, so in the past, anterior chamber seeding used to be in it an indication for enucleation, but not anymore. So we will start those children on systemic chemotherapy only because we, are, we still are worried that if the tumor's in the anterior chamber, it got there somehow, there must be either invasion into the iris or into the ciliary body, or somehow it got into the anterior chamber. So we'll put them on systemic chemotherapy, and then we inject topotecan into the anterior chamber. And you can use... Uh, Melphalan or topotecan, we prefer topotecan. We feel it's less toxic to the endothelium and it's uh, very simple to use. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if I can ask one question. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Shields, for that excellent talk. Just one question uh, Where do you put subretinal seeds management or the description or in the literature we don't have? nothing much more informed about the subretinal seeding. We have everything about the vitreous. So I lost his voice. Can you hear him? No, we lost it too. Yeah, we uh, lost muted. his voice. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. 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 So excellent talk, Dr. Shields. Just one question that is related to subretinal seeding. We have complete description about vitreous seeding, classification, treatment, but the literature is very scarce related to subretinal seeds. So what's your take on that? Yes, you're right about that. There is a classification for vitreous seeding and that was designed mostly so that we could make judgments 
uh, regarding potential outcomes after intravitreal injection of chemotherapy. But there is no classification for subretinal seeds. Subretinal seeds tend to respond well to intravenous chemotherapy, and they respond very well to intraarterial chemotherapy. In fact, if we see recurrent subretinal seeds after intravenous chemotherapy, we're pretty confident that intraarterial chemotherapy would clean them up. But again, you're right. There's no classification of subretinal seeding. Thank you, Dr. Shields. You're welcome. Dr. Shields, uh, Dr. Shields uh, yes. I have one question to ask. I'm, I'm Meli Shakur from Bangladesh. So uh, we get very many patients who are with advanced uh, orbital RB, retinoblastoma. So um, I want to know about the protocol I should follow in those most of them needs exenteration, but how many chemos I should give? And then what will I do postoperatively? That is one question. Sure. And I, I have dilemma with one patient uh, now. That patient is uh, regressed uh, uh, retinoblastoma in both the eyes, but he has um, anterior segment seeds and deposition. So I gave um, Tupotiken, and how many to injection I can give? And what can I do? Do I need to do the uh, inoculation in this patient? Sure. Uh, I'll start with your last question, then move on to your uh, first question. If, your if this child has already seen systemic chemotherapy and has recurrent anterior chamber seeds in both eyes? No, one eye. One eye. Yeah. I would... And, uh, uh, and uh, 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 retinal tumor is regressed, both eyes. Sure. Okay. So that's at least good news. Um, we would give topo -tican. We usually give approximately 10 micrograms and we inject it uh, usually once a month uh, for four cycles. Um, it's and very non toxic. Yeah. yeah. And I would keep a close watch on that child. And if they recur, uh, you might go back to intra aqueous chemotherapy or, or even um, consider plaque radiotherapy to the inter segment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, he was regressed. He was regressed. The interior chamber seating was regressed. And then again, it came, uh, there's recurrence. So it is a challenging case for me. Very challenging. Uh, you know, if you look at the reports by Mounier, there may be some trapped seeds in the posterior chamber around the lens. And, uh, you know, Mounier will aspirate the entire aqueous and inject melphalan. We tend to not do that technique, worried that it's going to cause cataract. We tend to inject topotecan and hope for the best. And if it recurs, we would put plaque radiation over the entire anterior segment. Now, regarding your first question, I have to admit, we have learned how to treat orbital retinoblastoma from your team in India. Uh, I think Dr. Hanavar has taught us more than anybody how to treat orbital retinoblastoma, and we use his protocol. He's one of the panelists here, and he may want to speak on this. Um, we give 12 cycles of high-dose chemotherapy, and at, say, month three or month four, we would perform enucleation. That's when, because the tumor has shrunken in the eye and then you enucleate the tysical eye, and then we continue them on the remainder of the uh, 12 cycles of chemotherapy. Um, Dr. Farooz and Dr. Hanavar um, have taught us uh, this. Uh, Dr. Shields, okay. uh, that's true. The, when they regress, we do the enucleation, but sometimes this is so big and uh, they do not regress also. Then I was asking about that. Exenteration. At one point, at what point we should do the exenteration, and after exenteration, how many cycle of uh, chemotherapy should we go on or radiotherapy? That was the, my uh, query. Mm -hmm. So, if I may just add here, hi, Doctor Millie. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, hi. So maybe I could add a little bit to whatever Dr. Shields has said uh, regarding your question on exenteration. It has been our experience that most cases of orbital retinoblastoma, they respond to uh, the first three cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the high-dose chemotherapy we see, which we use almost all over India. And uh, if we don't see an adequate response after three cycles, then we can try another three cycles of high-dose chemotherapy. And most of the 
other times, uh, you know, I mean, we have almost always never had to do an eccentration in any case of orbital retinoblastoma for the last, you know, uh, many, many years now, because most of these kids would, you know, I mean, it, it, the, the chemotherapy does result in, you know, a uh, good amount of shrinkage of the mass so that it becomes amenable to some form of enucleation. And then after that, we treat these uh, children with post-operative uh, external beam radiotherapy and the remaining cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, so but almost it's like, yeah, yes, please. Uh, uh, that is usual uh, situation. Yes. Yes. But in my situation, in my uh, uh, setup, I get such big uh, yes. uh, growth or orbital RB and those they, they don't respond to significant respond to um, VC. Eh? Yes. So that the situation I get I will am very like in trouble yeah I can um, totally yeah, understand again, they come with recurrence and that's why I want to just know I know that I have to give six cycle of uh, after yeah. uh, exenteration or enucleation adjuvant chemo and uh, sometimes um, do I give need to give high dose chemo always we give standard chemo so that was the my question I wanted to know so in right, orbit, uh, yeah, yeah, we can discuss that first. later if we have time, uh, because we can, you know, right now move on to the next. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, humble request to everybody, uh, because all the points, all the presentations are so crisp, so nice. I'm definitely sure you will be having a lot of questions, but we need to give time to every speaker to finish the presentations. And okay. let's do the question answers towards the end. That is a humble request to you. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> So I'd like to announce that our next speaker will be Dr. Martine Jaeger from the Netherlands, and she will be speaking on eye color and uveal melanoma. Dr. Jaeger. It's a great pleasure to speak to you today. It's amazing how techniques make it possible to meet all, from all over the world in one session in India. And I'm already looking forward to physically come to India again in uh, 2024 for the meeting of the International Society of Ocular Oncology in Goa. Well, one subject I'm now going to talk about is eye color and uveal melanoma in a collaborative study with Carol Shields. It takes a village for treating a patient. It takes a lovely international community to collaborate on obtaining research data. And these are the different PhD students who from many parts of the world who collaborated in Leiden to get the data on eye melanomas. These are several examples of an anterior chamber tumor and posterior chamber you feel melanoma. And in some parts of the world, this disease is more common than in others. It is quite common, relatively speaking, in Western Europe. And you feel melanoma is a malignant tumor of the eye, mainly in adults, average age 65. It's not frequent, but it has a really very high mortality rate of 50%. And as opposed to retinoblastoma, this has really not decreased over the last 50 years. <coughs> there are quite a number of risk factors why one can develop this malignancy. The main thing is that people get older and because they get older, they get different types of cancer and this is one of them. A nevus of OTA, is also a risk factor. And then the many risk factors have to do with Northern European ancestry, blonde hair, lack in the ability to tan, high numbers of freckles, high numbers of moles. And this was summarized by one of my students recently. Well, one of the things that one has that has a risk is eye color. It's defined by at least six genes and biochemically different eyes with different colors have different biochemistry. In the light colored eyes, when they are exposed to the sun, there may be more reactive oxygen species. 
and stimulate more mutations. But almost all uveal melanoma have the same type of mutations in GNAQ, GNA11, that occurs also in nevi, and then a series in uveal melanomas. This is a display of different eye colors and the world. Blue eyes are especially seen in Northern Europe, but also in Australia and the northeastern part of the United States. Blue eyes are especially common in Europe and in the Netherlands, which is one of the most uh, northern countries of Northern Europe. If one looks at different publications about uveal melanoma, then one can compare the iris colors in uveal melanoma cases with patients that, uh, with people that do not have an eye melanoma. And when you go down the left hand side and you look at blue and gray, then 61% of uveal melanoma patients have blue gray eyes and only 50% of the controls, while the opposite was true for brown eyes many more brown eyes in people without an eye melanoma. Now, when you see this, the first question that comes up, do people with those blue eyes have a higher risk for developing metastases? They have a higher risk of getting this tumor. And I already mentioned several items that occur for a higher risk of developing an eye melanoma, but Older age is also a risk factor for developing metastases or a large tumor size and specific chromosome aberrations, loss of one chromosome three or a specific aberration in chromosome 8Q. Important prognostic factor is tumor size. The larger the tumor, the top line, the, small, the less chance there is for developing metastases, and the larger the tumor gets, then the higher the chance of developing metastases. So size is really important. Then I already mentioned chromosomes, chromos loss of one chromosome three, a typical pattern, higher risk of developing metastases, or the RNA expression patterns, class one and class two, often used in the United States. But for the cost, we do not use that. Monosomy three, very clear distinction between a good prognosis at the top and a bad prognosis at the bottom. The different genetic prognostic factors lead to four groups, A, B, C, D, that either have a mutation in specific genes or the already mentioned chromosome aberrations. Monosomy 3 is the very bad situation with the chromosomes. So group C and D share that they have loss of one chromosome three, and both are the class two tumors with bad prognosis. So do we see differences related to eye color? We had a database, and the reason I started to look at this was not some theory, we found that out later, but I am a cornea doctor. and I wanted to see the eye melanoma patients. So I joined the clinic of my colleague, Marina Marinkovic. And after seeing 11 patients, I asked her, do really all the patients have blue eyes? Because in my cornea clinic, I have a mixture. But after I had seen 11 eye melanoma patients, I had only seen 11 people with blue eyes. So then we started to check. And luckily, the registration system also includes eye color. So we had 412 patients with eye melanomas and we knew the chromosome status. So we determined whether eye color had anything to do with prognosis. It did not. Here you see the three groups. Blue is blue eye color, green is green eye color and brown is brown eye color. So that did not make a difference, that it was not significant. But one, one we know that chromosome three is so important, we also looked at that. And now we separated the three groups, the blue eyes, the green eyes, and the people with brown eyes. And we looked at the effect of chromosome three. What is the effect of chromosome three on the survival of the patient with an eye melanoma? As I said, 50% of our patients will die. 
but there was a clear difference between the groups with the eye colors. When you look at the patients on the left with the blue eye colors, you see what we always see in our studies. The red line here is the patients with monosomy 3. They have a worse survival. Then you go to the middle and you see the patients with the green eyes, typical, by the way, for Northern Ireland also, and you see an enormous difference in survival. Patients with monosomy 3 and green eyes actually did very well. And when you go to the brown eyes on the right, you see that there is no difference in monosomy 3 survival and whether they have monosomy 3 or not. Well, this has not been published before, and we looked around all over the world where the people had similar uh, databases. And then there is one fantastic database and a very generous uh, researcher clinician, uh, the, the Carol Shields and the whole Shields group, and they have registered eye color as well. You also have to be in a certain part of the world because as I already mentioned, North, the Northeastern United States have a mixture of blue eyes and brown eyes, like what we have in Northern Europe. And uh, they allowed, they, we worked together to study this. And uh, we knew that they had these data because there was this uh, gorgeous paper uh, from the SHIELD group in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology last year about the Cancer Genome Atlas data. So we then looked at the effect of having blue eyes or brown eyes and the effect of the four different groups that I already mentioned, the ABCD, C and D have the high uh, malignancy. And on the left, you see people with blue eyes. And these are the typical graphs that you'll find in most of the uh, papers from the Northern European and Northern American uh, centers the higher the degree of malignancy, the worse the survival. But when looking at brown eyes, the differences were much less and the four categories did not separate as well as they did, as they did with blue eyes as to what we are used to. Now, you are in India. How does this, what does this mean for people in Asia? Uh, of course, having a brown eye does not prevent one from developing a uveal melanoma. And there are some uh, superb studies that describe the occurrence in India and Asia of choroidal melanoma. Uh, I advise you to certainly read the, the, these two from uh, Dr. Paul and Dr. Manshukoda, uh, written together with uh, two other panel members uh, speakers today. And the incidence in Asia is much lower than in Europe, but there are still quite a number of cases. There's a difference in the age. In Europe, this, uh, the mean age at presentation is 58. In the Netherlands, it's over 60. But in Asia, it is between 40 and 55 years. And it seems that survival is better. Uh, Two studies, including from my friend Krishna Kumar, showed that the risk for metastases is increased in India with epithelial tumors, loss of BEP1, and inflammatory phenotype, very similar to what we have described here. But the one essential thing is that it is essential to look more, as Dr. Manshikova has written, studies are needed to determine how the different prognostic factors, especially the genetic ones, affect Asians with a uveal melanoma. And other conclusions, people with blue or green eyes have a higher risk of developing a uveal melanoma than those with brown eyes. But Asians should beware of the nevus of OTA. That seems to occur there more often and more often in association with a uveal melanoma. And chromosome aberrations, as seen in uh, Europe and United States, have more effect on survival in green and blue eyes than in brown eyes. And why would you like to know the chance of survival? Patients want to know what their chances are, whether they have to settle their estate and, uh, and have the risk of dying in a short time, but also for uh, prognostication for adjuvant trials, 
uh, which will in the not too distant future future be developed similar to that they are now for cutaneous melanoma and uh, many thanks to our LUMC oncology team and to my collaborators in the lab and of course to Dr. Shields and her fantastic group and I invite you to come to the, to the ISOO 2022 in Leiden in June and we I was very happy that I could distribute nice travel grants to quite a large number of superb Indian uh, doctors who submitted the superb abstracts we did that yesterday and thank you very much for your attention thank you thank you Dr. Jager that was an excellent presentation any questions for Dr. Jager Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Yeah, I was interested in that map that you showed of Europe, Northern Africa, and part of Asia, uh, eye color. Where did you obtain that map? Oh, I looked all over it on the internet. Wow. And then I found it. <laughs> and uh, uh, well, in, the, in the Netherlands, it's quite interesting. You can go back through history to find out how it is. The Netherlands were divided. In the north, we have the northern invaders, the Vikings. In the south, we have the Roman Empire. So in this country, the north and the south are divided. But in northern India, uh, you had the invasion from uh, Alexander the Great. And uh, I have been told that there are quite a number of blue colored people in the, the north of India. Yeah, well, it's, it's before Alexander the Great. They all come from Turkmenistan. So. There's much more history to it, but you're absolutely right. People in North India, Kashmir region, where I come from, um, many people would look like Iranians and, and, and yeah. you know, that kind of Turkish, we kind of tell them apart. They all look the same with even blue eyes. Yeah. Some of my cousins have blue eyes. Hmm? Yeah. So it's, it's a surprise, <laughs> but that's absolutely right. There is a different racial. India has a very mixed racial kind of uh, historic influences, if you want to call it that. Yeah, the Aryans, Aryans and Dravidians, you know, the North and the South India, the lineage comes from the Aryans in North India and the Dravidians in South India. Yeah, so South India is, is Africans and the North Indians are people from Turkmenistan, the present Turkmenistan. Yeah. Can I make a comment, Dr. Bauer? Yeah, sure. Please, please uh, go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Jacob, for a wonderful lecture. But like uh, of all the melanomas we have seen in India, as she said very rightly, they're younger. But like I have not seen a blue-eyed one, actually. Almost all of them have had brown eyes. So that's what I have seen. And mortality data for Indians at the present moment is not available. So the, the study you quoted, I had did the previous part of the study where we had studied about 100 eyes. So at the present moment, I don't think we have reliable mortality data for melanoma in India. The, the one thing to do... Uh, uh, is to analyze BAP1 expression. It's an immunohistochemical stain, and uh, that is not an uh, elaborate or difficult or expensive test. And the data that come forward from the BAP1 staining are uh, quite reliable, not as perfect as chromosome 3 testing or RNA testing, uh, but it gives a lot of information. And the cost for uh, chromosome analysis is going down all the time. So uh, I would not be surprised if institutes that deal with, uh, for instance, uh, hemato hematogenous malignancies would be able to do some type of chromosome testing for solid tumors as well. The mutation analysis is also getting more and more important, for instance, for cutaneous melanoma, which drug to treat a patient with. So the the major centers that deal with either solid tumors or other solid tumors or with hematogenous mal malignancies might be able to do that type of testing for a, a very decent price. But the BAP1 staining, uh, that should be available in all of your large institutes. Yeah, I agree. I work with Dr. Krishna Kumar as well. I used to work with him earlier as well. But the issue is like the real mortality data, how many patients have really died out of melanoma is something which we don't have in India. 
uh, I'm sure one day it will you will be able to okay. get those data because the registration and the patients that come back uh, is getting better and better. May I ask a question? This, uh, the subject of, of latitude and sunlight exposure and incidents in different parts of the world has uh, been visited and revisited. Do you think in the end it has more to do with iris color and who's living where? Yes, I'm absolutely convinced that the iris color is the, the most the genetic basis of a person is the most important for the risk factors. Uh, and uh, But it may be that light, not necessarily ultraviolet light, but maybe blue light may have an influence. The more people are outside, the higher risk they may have. Uh, but the, the data from Europe are quite convincing that you find the most patients all the way to the north in countries like Finland, Norway, and Sweden. And the same actually is the case as all the work by uh, Arun Singh, for instance, has shown. You find more eye melanomas in the north than in the south. And that is also due to genetics. The if you look at Michigan in the United States, there is a city called Holland, Michigan, because the Dutch went mm -hmm. there. And yes. uh, 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 Seddon published that eye color is a risk factor, but that specific Northern European ancestry is a risk factor for all the Swedes that went to the north of the United States. So it, it really seems to be the background of people. And maybe it's eye color, maybe it's something else because it goes together with blonde hair and uh, a light skin. So, but it seems to be that, that pheomelanin stuff. And how that exactly works, we do not know yet how the biochemistry of it all works together. But it's, it's a really new finding that uh, it's not only we published in ophthalmology that it was the eye color uh, and that it is chromosome three, but it goes for other factors as well. We also looked at PRAME and uh, it's even for size, it makes a difference what your eye color is. So it, it is much wider than only the chromosomes. Eye color really makes a difference in whether you develop it and whether the changes in the tumor influence the development of metastases. So you have to look not only at the tumor, but at the whole person. Excellent insight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank well, you, Dr. There... Yeah, sorry, sorry, please. Uh, I sorry. was just gonna say, if there are no more questions, uh, yeah. Maybe we can move on to our next talk, which will be by uh, Dr. Arun Singh from the Cleveland Clinic, and he will be speaking on iris tumors, when to worry. Arun? Well, it's a distinct honor to participate with uh, all these uh, experts, and uh, so, so thanks for including me. The topic uh, is iris tumors, when to worry. I'm Arun Singh from uh, Kola Institute here. So. Iris tumors present a unique challenge. They are actually quite common, maybe perhaps certainly the benign ones, and they are generally very small compared to other tumors that we see, and they represent large variety. And many patients are asymptomatic. They do go for normal exams or contact lens evaluations, and they'll have normal vision. And so you end up with a patient who has no symptoms and you see a tumor and you want to treat them. And so there is this acceptance hesitancy on the patient's part, and which is has to be understood. So the steps in management really are the initial diagnosis. You do a good slit lamp exam and you can pretty much figure out what you think is going on. So that's your first thing. And then you may have one or two differential diagnoses, but you can only do a limited number of tests. You can only do, for example, the three things, anterior segment, um, you know, OCT, you can do a fluorescein angiogram of the anterior segment, you can do UBM. These are only three imaging tests that one can do uh, to figure out what the tumor might be. And you really have four management options. You can either observe them if you think they're benign, you can biopsy them if you think they're more significant in some way, or you can radiate them based upon the biopsy results. So your options are kind of limited. And in this talk, I also want to highlight a new way of managing small tumors, which is kind of an excisional biopsy technique. So let's look at some of the clinical finding that might be irrelevant. So here's a patient with a 
pigmented iris tumor and you can easily see seeding on exam and also on gonio. So this I think is an important finding, we all agree on that. Secondly, here is a patient again with a peripheral iris tumor and you say, well, it's nothing till you do gonio and you can easily see angle and ciliary body involvement. You can see that on contrast illumination. And I want to highlight here that the OCT is not good for angle or ciliary body assessment. Let's say ciliary body assessment. So for that, you really need a UBM. And in this particular patient, there was a ciliary body extension. One can see that by, by UBM. So what can you do? Well, you have again many options. You say, well, this is a nevus with iridociliary component. But most of us believe that if there's ciliary body component, we really want to treat them. Although there are instances of ciliary body nevi that have been excised and published. But here we went with FNAB, confirmed it to be melanoma and put a plaque that has the least morbidity for the patient. Here's another patient with again angle involvement. One can see a central displacement of iris. It tells you it's a ciliary body tumor with iris extension. And here this was excised and histopathology showed it to be a nevus. So we talk about iris nevi and we talk about corridor nevi. Well, here's a biopsy proven case of ciliary body nevus. So ciliary body nevi also exists. It's just that we are not able to see them or diagnose them readily. So here's a young man who's 17 years old with an iris tumor. It's a stromal tumor. You can see anterior and posterior expansion of the ciliary of the iris stroma. And you say, oh yeah, this is a nevus. Well, I had seen him five years before. And I had a photograph in my, from my assessments, and you say, uh, clearly, a growth is present here. So a growing tumor, an iris pigmented growing tumor, to me, is a melanoma. People may disagree with that. And we excised it. I did, and this was melanoma, histopathologically. Here's the child uh, after treatment. You can see people have been reconstructed, and it looks pretty good. So here's a patient with a vascular tumor. This, of course, is not melanoma. Most of us will agree on that. Could be inflammatory granuloma or metastasis. This was biopsied and showed it to be metastasis from renal site, renal cancer, and was treated with plaque and avastin. So again, a vascularity of the tumor was concerning. Now here's a patient with appears to be kind of darkish cystic looking lesion sitting on the iris. On fluorescein angiogram has no vascularity whatsoever. It's totally dark, so obviously it's not vascular. And on the UBM, one can say it's kind of sitting on top of the iris stroma. One can imagine normal stroma in the background here. So we say it's above the stroma, but we really couldn't tell. Of course, it's not melanoma, I would say, but we really didn't know what it was. So there's some issue with diagnosis. What is it that we're dealing with? We excised it. And because we thought the stroma was normal, we just kind of shaved it off on the surface of the stroma. And one can see after surgery, we have maintained the sphincter and the pupillary people looks normal and this happened to be an iris avarix it's a rare kind of a vascular benign tumor so here's a child or well, he's 18 years old went for contact lens exam and one can see a amelanotic peripheral iridociliary tumor which is highly vascular it was not there the year before he went for contact lens exam so again a recent onset made us think that this is uh, could be a melanoma it's highly vascular we excised it by hydrocyclectomy because it did go into ciliary body. That was a melanoma. Here's another patient with a very vascular, similar looking tumor arising from mid stroma of the iris on the fluorescein. You can see high amount of vascularity. A tumor like this, I'm hesitant to biopsy because they'll get high femur. And this patient actually has no symptoms. Like I said, they're 20 20 vision, normal pressure, and they're walking around and you see a tumor. We excised it completely. It came out to be lyomyoma. Lyomyoma is a smooth muscle tumor arising from the smooth muscle, it seems, of the iris vessel. So there you go. You can't really tell easily, I don't think clinically, um, it's this or that. Here's another patient with an iridociliary tumor-like appearance. On UBM, one can see it's kind of invading the sclera. It's beyond its normal space, so to speak. We excised it and come back as sarcoidosis. So this is an inflammatory granuloma that mimicked a tumor. So not everything is a tumor necessarily, but you can see. Some of them are large. So obviously this isn't a nevus, right? Most of us will agree that this is not a nevus. So I mentioned in my different cases certain features that I think are alarming to some extent where we would want to intervene. 
We did FNAB, put a plaque after that, and he did very well. I want to highlight another case. It's again a recently detected small tumor of the iris. It's kind of vascular. You can see that on the floors in angiogram. And we excised it. It's stromal. So it's, we say, well, it's a nevus melanoma. We really can't tell apart. But because it had not been seen before, we had this clear documentation of his prior records, we wanted to excise it. So a traditional approach would be a wide limbal-based incision. You cut one-third, one-fourth of the limbus and kind of cut it that way. But we used a different so-called laparoscopic or small incision approach, multiple incisions here. You're cutting the iris. And I want to just show a quick video. So after you've done that and you've released the tumor into the anterior chamber, we are using this uh, DSEC cannula, which has been loaded with uh, viscoelastic, and you're able to aspirate the tumor right into this cannula. The advantage being that once you remove the cannula, you haven't really seeded the, the wound. The tumor came out totally protected. I think that's a good thing we like to see. We do not want to uh, spread the tumor. And more importantly, now you just express this cannula uh, or the tumor onto the filter paper. And so you have a tumor which has not been touched or manipulated and the margins have been maintained and you'll get a good assessment on pathology whether you got clear margins or not. So he looks post-op one week, very good. He has no astigmatism um, and he did very well. So here's the, the sample. You can see very nicely that the tumor has not been uh, crushed or uh, rolled over, it's flattened and you can see the margins and margins were negative. So we can done it with even for bigger tumors, for example, like this. Here's a, a young nurse from Pittsburgh area Blue eye, huh, Martin? <laughs> a blue eye with brown tumor. And here it is, she was excised and she did very well. You can see the pupil is equal size in ambient light. Again, the suture goes near the colorate and that will give you a good size pupil. So we published this study and that's fine. So coming back to the biggest thing, at least in our practices is, is it nevus or melanoma? And that's not a straight answer, it's kind of a little tortuous. And I don't think we have clear criteria to differentiate, but there are certain things that increase the probability of the tumor being a melanoma and less likely to be nevus. And one would say is a recent onset, like a case I showed here. Presence of growth, I think we agree uh, to a large extent that it will go along with the diagnosis of melanoma. Tumor that's more than three millimeter in any base cell, any diameter, I think thickness or base, either way, is more likely to be melanoma. Presence of vascularity, presence of high fever ciliary body extension and angle seating. All these things I think are the features that would make me think the tumor is melanoma versus nevus or certainly malignant and not benign. And of course, uh, in cases of diagnostic uncertainty, uh, I would treat it with respect and try to get the diagnosis. I think with that, I finish. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my experiences. Thank you. All right, so Mary our uh, chairperson to please invite the next speaker. Um, I, I'll invite the next speaker. The next speaker will be uh, Mary Aronow. She, she will be speaking on the spectrum of intraocular lymphoma, a condition that is still an enigma to many of us. So Mary, look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to speak with all of you about the spectrum of intraocular lymphoma. I don't have any financial disclosures to report. And this is an actual email that I received from a journal editor some years ago asking me to write a review on this subject. And perhaps- Sorry, ma'am, I interrupt you, ma'am. Please share your screen, ma'am. Your slide is not visible, ma'am. Give me one second here. Roger. We can see your slides now. Yes, yes, no. I apologize, can you, can you see it now? Yes, looks good. Great, sorry about that. Um, so this is an actual email that I received from an editor from a journal some years ago asking me to rewrite uh, a review on this subject. And we may have all have felt this way at times because lymphomas can be very challenging to diagnose and to treat. So I'm hoping I can shed some light on this subject and also to share some of my uh, more challenging cases with all of you. 
I'm going to talk about the full spectrum of intraocular lymphoma and how to differentiate the various forms based upon their clinical features and also just share some practice pearls. Specifically, I want to talk about how these tumors are very good at masquerading, how we have this added challenge of the fact that many of our patients come to us on steroids and how that affects the diagnosis and, and staging of this disease, how ancillary imaging can be helpful, uh, the importance of doing a thorough examination, and a little bit about biopsy of these tumors. Broadly, intraocular lymphomas can be categorized as vitreoretinal lymphomas, uveal lymphomas, and secondary intraocular manifestations of systemic lymphomas. Let's start with primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. These can be thought of as a variant of central nervous system lymphoma. These are high-grade aggressive lymphomas that are predominantly diffuse large B cell in origin. They can also be in a very small percentage of cases, T cell or natural killer cell lymphomas. They have a very poor prognosis. They can involve the brain, the spinal cord, leptomeninges, and of course the eyes. If we take all comers with primary central nervous system lymphoma, approximately a quarter of them will have vitreoretinal involvement at the time of diagnosis. And if we look at patients who present with vitreoretinal lymphoma, nearly 60 to 90% will ultimately develop central nervous system disease over time. Classic features are vitreous cell, particularly when the cells are exuberant or clumped or demonstrate that classic aura borealis appearance. Subretinal pigment epithelium infiltrates are also common. I wanna to talk to you about a case that I saw recently and we published in the Journal of Vitreoretinal Diseases. This is a good example of how these tumors can really masquerade. I call this case, Here Today, Gone Tomorrow. It's a 65-year-old Asian American woman who had blurry vision in floaters for about a year. And she was noted uh, before she was referred to me to have a peripapillary infiltrate in the left eye. So here you can see the left fundus and she has this creamy yellow to white subretinal infiltrate above the optic nerve. It's very pronounced. And here's her OCT. You can see that she has this um, infiltrate involving the subretinal pigment epithelium. If you look very carefully on the OCT, you can see that she has some vitreous cell. And even more pronounced is this sub retinal infiltrate. Now, whether that's an inflammatory infiltrate or those are lymphoma cells, it's hard to know for sure. But we did biopsy her vitreous and it confirmed diffuse large B cell lymphoma with positive MyD88 mutation, clenching the diagnosis. Here's the amazing thing. We saw her a couple of times over the period in which she was undergoing her staging evaluation, meaning she was getting her MRI brain, lumbar puncture, um, blood test, systemic evaluation, and that infiltrate disappeared completely without any treatment. Amazing. This is spontaneous regression. And here's her OCT. You can see that that subretinal infiltrate disappeared completely, and the RPE even looks better. Again, this is without any treatment. I have to wonder how often that happens, and, and we're not aware of it. Um, here's another case. This could be viral retinitis, but it's not. This is a, a gentleman who has known primary central nervous system lymphoma with ocular involvement, and he got better with systemic high-dose methotrexate. Here's another case that looks like peripheral vasculitis. The lymphoma is a great masquerader. It can look like a number of other entities, and that makes it challenging to, to diagnose. Here's a case that demonstrates the challenge of the fact that many of our patients come to us on steroids. This is a 72-year-old Caucasian lady with a history of, quote, uveitis. She had had uh, floaters for about eight months. She had a negative uveitis workup that was fairly extensive, and her symptoms and clinical findings were progressive despite topical and oral steroids. So we have a very high index of suspicion that this may actually be lymphoma. Clinical findings are classic. She has vitreous um, cell, creamy subretinal infiltrates. 
Here's a closer view of the sub-RPE infiltrate. Here's the left eye, again, lots of cells, haze, hemorrhage, subretinal infiltrate. And the fluorescein shows foci of uh, punctate hyperfluorescence scattered throughout the fundus, which is classic for vitreoretinal lymphoma. OCT shows uh, sub-RPE infiltration, again, classic for vitreoretinal lymphoma. And, and we decided she didn't have any findings uh, other than the eye when we met her. So we did a diagnostic vitrectomy, but she came to us on 60 milligrams of oral prednisone, which she had been on for a month. So we tapered her off of that rapidly before we did her vitrectomy, and we got positive cytology on the first try. This was atypical lymphoid infiltrate consistent with a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and a positive MyD88 mutation. But I wanna make this point. When we met her and she had her initial staging, she had this MRI, and the neuroradiologist did pick up on this finding that I have highlighted with the red arrow and described it as probable age-related microvascular uh, ischemic disease, consider repeating MRI in the coming months. Well, I uh, really pushed her primary team to repeat her staging after she had been tapered off of the steroids. Here she is one month following cessation of steroids. Here's her MRI. That is not microvascular ischemic disease, that's lymphoma, and it entirely stages entirely changes her uh, baseline staging and her treatment plan. Furthermore, they also repeated her lumbar puncture and that showed atypical lymphocytes concerning for involvement of her known diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So she doesn't have vitreoretinal lymphoma. She has bilateral ocular disease, brain and CSF findings. That really changes her management and it's so important to recognize the lympholytic effect that steroids can have on these patients. So let's change gears and talk about uveal lymphoma. Uveal lymphoma, also a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of B-cell origin, tends to be more indolent with a better prognosis. The majority of cases are extranodal marginal zone, although they can be other subtypes, and these are very low-grade lymphomas. Ancillary imaging can be very helpful. Here's a case demonstrating that. It's a 48-year-old Caucasian male who had had fluctuating vision in the left eye for two years and good vision. The fundus shows lobular creamy choroidal infiltrates scattered throughout the fundus. And I love how ICG just highlights those infiltrates and makes them really uh, stand out. I like to do ultrasound in both the affected and the fellow eye, because in addition to seeing choroidal thickening, sometimes we see these areas of extrascleral extension with have, have a predilection for being near the optic nerve. And that provides an additional site for biopsy, particularly when these flat uh, lobular choroidal infiltrates are really not amenable to biopsy and doing choroidal biopsies in general has a high complication rate. So this is just an additional site of biopsy, something to think about. Here's the correlate with neuroimaging. You can see the extrascleral extension. And here's another similar case. 68-year-old Caucasian male. It had elevated pressure in the right eye for a year. He has these creamy choroidal infiltrates, more pronounced in the left eye. The ICG highlights those areas of infiltration within the choroid. And the ultrasound shows diffuse choroidal thickening and also a substantial area of extrascleral extension near the optic nerve. So this is where I like to pause when I'm speaking to the residents and fellows and ask what they think that we should do next. And they will often enthusiastically point out that this is an area that we can biopsy. And I say, that's right, but we didn't. Because when we lift his eyelid, he had this salmon patch and that's much easier to biopsy. So it's just very important um, to be very thorough when examining this patient, these patients. And this is something that we have um, noted, it's been pointed out before, and we've looked at our patients who have ocular adnexal lymphoma, and we noted that almost 16% of them have uveal involvement. And you can look at that vice versa in patients with uveal lymphoma and see that some um, proportion of them are gonna have ocular adnexal lymphoma. And Arun Singh has published on this too, that really we can think of uveal lymphoma as a variant of ocular adnexal lymphoma. I 
I have one case that I want to show you that highlights something important about secondary intraocular manifestations of systemic lymphoma. This is a 63-year-old man who had an incidentally noted choroidal mass. His last dilated fundus examination was a year ago, and it was normal, and he had relatively good vision. The interesting thing about him is he has a history of systemic diffuse large B-cell lymphoma back in 2008, and that involved his right clavicle. He uh, had treatment for that and had no evidence of a disease for about 10 years following. When he presented with the choroidal mass, he had restaging. So he had a full body PET CT, he had blood work, he had a bone marrow biopsy. There was no evidence of any recurrence of his lymphoma anywhere. And here's what the eye looked like. Here's a closer view of that tumor in the right eye. And you can see it's in the choroid, it's amelanotic. It appears to have some vascularity within it. And that is confirmed with the angiogram. You can see there's some vascularity within this tumor. On the ultrasound, it's sizable, 16.6 millimeters by 14.9 by seven and a half millimeters in thickness with some overlying exudative retinal detachment. And on the A scan, it demonstrates low internal reflectivity. He had an MRI and on the T1 post contrast sequence, the tumor was hyper intense and on T2, it was hypo intense. So everything that I have shown you is um, basically typical of a choroidal melanoma. But you might say, well, why, why did he get this MRI? And the reason is that he presented initially to our emergency room with proptosis. And so in the emergency room, he had this MRI and he was found to have a right orbital mass. So he has an orbital mass and an intraocular mass. And the question is this lymphoma, is this a recurrence of his known systemic lymphoma with intraocular and orbital involvement? Or does he have a uveal melanoma with orbital lymphoma? Could it be a melanoma with extraocular extension or is it something else? So we biopsied the choroidal tumor um, using a fine needle fine needle aspiration biopsy technique. And then we also did an orbital uh, biopsy of that component. And the two biopsies were highly concordant and they showed lymphocytes, large lymphocytes that were positive uh, for CD20, suggesting a B cell origin and negative for MART1, the melanoma stain. So the diagnosis here is diffuse large B cell lymphoma, both with intraocular and orbital component. And that's very important for him because it entirely changes his um, treatment regimen. So in summary, vitreoretinal lymphoma is a high grade, aggressive, typically diffuse large B cell lymphoma with a poor prognosis. Key features are vitreous cells and sub RPE infiltrates. It's a very good masquerader and we should have a high index of suspicion, particularly in our elderly patients who have new onset uveitis. And always remember that steroids can influence the diagnosis and, and really that they can impact staging. Uveal lymphoma is a low grade, indolent, predominantly extranodal marginal zone lymphoma. It's characterized by uveal infiltrates. We can think of it as a variant of ocular adnexal lymphoma. And just remember that within this spectrum of intraocular lymphoma, each one has distinct clinical features and that they can be differentiated always do a thorough ophthalmic examination. Um, ancillary imaging is very helpful. Systemic evaluation and always collaborate with your oncology teams when treating these patients. Um, and speaking of collaborators, I just want to thank all of the, um, the oncologists, my ophthalmology colleagues, our pathologists, ultrasound team um, who have worked with me on these cases and, and, and shared their expertise with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Dr. Carol, can we invite the next speaker, please? So, uh, yeah. So, there, there, so we have kept now time for questions. Uh, the rest of the time of the session will now be devoted to questions because there are already yes. quite a few questions that are coming up from the panelists. So I would first invite uh, Rishi. Rishi has been here and he has a question for Dr. Arun. Rishi, do you want to? Hello? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for the 
collection of uh, iris cases, Dr. Singh. Um, I, my question is, can you comment a little bit on the role of OCT and geography in characterization of iris tumors and perhaps also ocular surface tumors, if you could? Thank you. So the OCTA, right, OCTA. So we have done so far, mostly fluorescein angiogram, the usual injection of fluorescein. And we've tried to do some OCTA and we're finding a lot of interference with the pigment and the shape of the iris, the way the tumors are. It's a lot of artifacts. So I'm not really able to see everything that I wanna see. So that's number one. And number two, the leakage. So these vessels may not be visible, for example, because the pigment is masking them. And so you do expect some leakage from these incompetent vessels within the iris tumor that may spill over from the margin out to the normal areas on the fluorescein, which of course you will never see with OCTA. So um, I'm sure OCTA, I know there are cases and reports that are published and we are aware of those, but I, I still think fluorescein will give you a better um, the view of things than the OCTA. That's for the iris tumors. Um, I haven't done OCTA for the surface tumors. We do normal OCT for CIN-like things to see corneal thickness uh, because the tumor invades into the epithelium of the cornea and you can see the thickening and sharp hyperreflectivity that corresponds with sometimes subtle uh, corneal involvement. In the conjunctiva, I mean, as we all agree, the clinical exam tells you pretty much everything, but if there's a pterygium and you're not sure, that there is some growth, uh, malignant transformation within the pterygium because the stroma is kind of distorted. You can do OCD on the pterygium and you'll see thickened epithelium because pterygium is essentially a stromal disease, not so much in the epithelium. So in, in, in challenging cases, I think OCT has some role. OCTA, not really much in my, my limited experience. Yeah, I could make a comment. We. Uh have occasionally used OCTA for anterior segment tumors. And I agree with you. It's not that beneficial unless the tumor is really flat and the iris is very blue. There's not a lot of pigment. Or if you use it for conj tumors, again, a flat, because you have to align the OCT along the vessels within the mass. So it's not that helpful. In our practice, um, OCTA serves one big role, and that is uh, establishing how ischemic the macula is after radiation. That's basically. Bhavna, can I have a question for Dr. Arun? Yeah, sure. Please Dr. go ahead. Hi, Hi Dr. Arun. Uh, excellent talk. So my question for you is regarding iris melanocytoma. We know that it's a benign tumor, but uh, sometimes, you know, we have this diffuse trabecular meshwork involvement uh, with uh, iris melanocytoma and a diffuse one which actually progresses. How do right. you deal with these lesions? So number one, you have to make a diagnosis and you need some kind of a tissue diagnosis. So I would certainly do FNAB knowing, knowing that some cases of melanoma may be overlooked. We understand that. But if you see these heavily pigmented, mm -hmm. uniformly pigmented polygonal cells and you can't see the nucleus on even cytology, our cytologists feel very comfortable in saying, hey, this is compatible with melanocytoma. So that's very important for tissue diagnosis. If you cannot do FNAB, then you need to do some kind of incisional biopsy. Mm -hmm. But you need that diagnosis. That's number one. And otherwise, you, they, they will undergo necrosis and they can will cause inflammation. And they will also, after that, regress then we published such a case in, in Retina Journal. So you support them. If they have glaucoma, treat them with glaucoma. If they have U, uveitis, control uveitis. If they get cataract, once you, you have a good feeling about the tumor, the diagnosis, you can, they can have cataract surgery. They have undergone vitrectomy if they're vitreceding. So you can do all those things, but you need to have this comfort level about the diagnosis. And if you don't have that, don't do any intraocular surgery till then. Yeah, because most of the time they have secondary glaucoma, you know. Yeah, so and you, then you it's treat like, them with the drops. Yeah. yeah, do whatever you need to do. Till you're sure it's, it's nothing else, and then you can do whatever you want. All yeah. right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Feroz. I think uh, Subina also has a question for Dr. Arun. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bhavna. Uh, Dr. Arun, it was excellent talk. I would uh, like to ask about like for anterior segment plaque, uh, is amniotic membrane uh, the standard of care, the amniotic membrane buffer technique, how to go about it, please? 
So let's talk about anterior segment radiation. If it's diffuse disease of the iris, I would say proton is better option as far as the dosimetry goes, okay? But here we're talking about sectoral disease, circumscribed disease, where plaque perhaps is okay because you're not covering the whole limbus, okay? So that's that. Now, patient will get radiation keratitis, so amniotic membrane really doesn't serve any purpose because the radiation will go through that. What it's trying to minimize is the mechanical erosion of the corneal epithelium. And so you can use anything. We use, I use tutoplast, particularly where those, where they are, where those uh, uh, hooks are where, for the suturing because they are a little bit sharp edges. Other than that, nothing really. And radiation keratitis will heal within a week or two with topical steroids. So that's all you need to do. Dr. Carroll, you spoke about the same thing yesterday, right? Yes, for uh, anterior segment melanoma, yeah. uh, we use plaque radiotherapy. We do a 360 degree pyridomy, so we never get stem cell loss. Uh, the plaque is placed directly over the tumor. If it's, in, if it's involving the entire anterior segment, it'll go completely over the anterior segment. We tend to put a little bit of tissue glue, not enough to raise the plaque off the cornea, but just to hold the plaque stable so it doesn't move as you know, as the eye looks right and left, and patients tend to do well. I mean, in most cases, the eye is saved. Can I we, we make do a, a, a Gunderson a flap comment? over the plaque over also, yeah. One very basic, just want to mention a few things about this proton beam radiation versus plaque for anterior segment tumors. In proton, everything will get 60 gray equivalent or less. With plaque, everything will get 85 or more. So think about the radiation dose distributions. With plaque, the tumor will get 85 and everything else will get more. Cornea will get more than that. Limbus will get more than that. Mm -hmm. And with proton, tumor will get 60 and everything will get less than that. So when it's a sectoral disease, I think you're okay. But when it's a diffuse disease, radiation dosimetry clearly supports proton being superior. And we send patients to Boston. Uh, we have no hesitation in doing that. We have few patients of diffuse iris melanoma, and people have sent their good results. So, and you can also harvest limbal stem cells before radiation. You can take the, we have done that and we have published that too, and people in uh, Sweden, uh, Switzerland have also done that. You can cut out the limbal stem cells, put in the MK media for a week while you do the plaque or proton, and after that, put the limbal stems back in there, and they will regrow and maintain the limbal stem cells. So you can, preserve the limbal stem cells of that area because that need not be exposed before radiation. And that's all been published and done. So there are many ways to preserve the corneal complications, which are actually most difficult to manage after radiation. Glaucoma you can manage, cataract you can manage, but if there's a corneal decompensation, then you're kind of stuck. I think Mary might share some experience about proton beam irradiation. They use a yes, lot of Boston. Yes, um, and so I will add one nice thing about using proton beam for anterior segment tumors is that it doesn't require any surgery. We have, um, especially more recently, been using a light field technique where you can just use the incident light ray uh, so that it's corresponding with the proton beam <clears throat> to treat the tumor. So it doesn't require any localizing <clears throat> like fiduciary marker rings or anything like that. And we've used it for conjunctival tumors, iris tumors, ciliary body tumors, so it's quite quite versatile as a technique, and I think it's nice for the patients in terms of a, you know avoiding any surgery. Can you make a comment, Dr. Bana? Sure, please go ahead. Yeah, well, like, one concern is the proton in India is around fifty to seventy-five times as expensive as bracket therapy. That's the only concern right now. That just yesterday we had a patient of a choroidal melanoma and you know we gave him the option of proton beam irradiation and yeah, he came back saying that the estimate is 55 lakhs that's right that's right just <laughs> one lakh for plaque radiotherapy so it's uh, affordable and, yeah and we have just one center in india that's the issue yes. yeah w where is that located? Dr. may i ask one question to dr Carol? yes it's please yes. Ah. Madam, Dr. Carol, how often you use the periocular chemotherapy for retinoblastoma? And what is your technique, whether you use some vehicle or direct uh, uh, chemotherapy drug periocular radial? 
How often, your question was, how often do we use periocular chemotherapy? Yeah. Yes, we used, to, we used to use that much more commonly uh, in the days before intravitreal chemotherapy and intraaqueous chemotherapy. Uh, we don't use it anymore. So uh, it's sort of in our clinic, sort of gone out of favor only because there have been cases of um, fibrosis of the extraocular muscles. I've personally seen a case of a large pterygium that developed because the chemo came up to the limbus and wiped out the stem cell. The conj grew onto the cornea. So, and the team from memory published on optic neuropathy. So we don't inject chemo around the eye for retinoblastoma. Now, having said that, there is a chemotherapy plaque that is being studied in Canada by Brenda Galley, um, where topotecan is embedded into a plaque that is glued onto the eye for several weeks. And that seems to be um, pretty uh, efficacious. And she hasn't published anything uh, regarding her trials, but um, it seems like she's getting some good results with that. Getting back to the iris melanoma, I just want to give, you know, our opinion in Philly. Um, we, you know, the, the team Zagrofos using proton beam in Switzerland did have a problem for a while with, with stem cell loss. And uh, as Arun said, he was harvesting stem cells mm -hmm. so that he could avoid this. Um, but it's something that we don't see with plaque radiation. We don't have stem cell loss because we pull the conjunctiva up over the plaque so the peripheral stem cells are protected from the radiation. But I do think both techniques are, you know, uh, two alternatives for, con you know, con more conservative control of uvula iris melanoma. I have a question for Dr. Shields. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure. We have time. If Dr. Shields is not tired. I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, excellent talk, ma'am. As usual, I always enjoy the talks. So there's a small query about a case. A case has a very small melanoma, a macular, um, sorry, very small retinoblastoma. It's a macular retinoblastoma, less than three millimeter. So you try to do triple D therapy, but the MRI shows small discontinuity in the scleral coats, the outfire. So we just thought of clubbing it with plaque brachytherapy because normally a small tumor does not, should not metastasize. It should not have extraocular extension. But this patient shows some discontinuity in the outer coats of eye. Should we club it with the plaque therapy or just do triple T and forget about it and keep on regular follow? So you were going to do TTT, transpupillary thermotherapy alone with no chemotherapy? Uh, yes, ma'am. The patient is, uh, yeah, he did get team chemotherapy also. Okay. Um, it would be uh, very. A, a look of. Uh, the look of retinoblastoma is showing regression. It shows calcification, but the MRI shows discontinuity in the outer coats of the eye. So should we chase that or should we leave it? Yeah. Given the size of this tumor, less than three millimeters in uh, diameter, it would be highly unlikely for that to invade into the outer coats of the eye. We would use the standard six cycles of VEC if that's what the child is on. And we would probably still consolidate it unless it's in the fovea. Our general rule for consolidation is uh, we consolidate everything, except if it's in the papillomacular bundle or the fovea, we will simply watch. Now, having said that, I know that the team at Moorefields now with VEC, they don't consolidate anymore. So it's interesting. Um, when we do intraarterial chemotherapy, we don't consolidate anything. And maybe we don't need to be consolidating as much anymore uh, maybe now that we have intraarterial chemotherapy, if there is recurrence, we can always go on to that because every time you consolidate, 
you're creating a scotoma. And sometimes yeah. a big arcuate scotoma, the closer you consolidate to the optic disc. So in that case, in answer to your question, A, I would follow that quote thinning of the sclera. It would be very unusual for a three millimeter tumor to go through the sclera. Uh, B, I would probably be conservative and simply uh, follow with MRI. And I don't think I would consolidate just because there was that concern there. And I would only do plaque if we saw activity of the tumor. But thank you for your question. Can I yeah, add I have something? one question to Dr. Anusan. Okay. Uh, we do okay. fluorescein angiography to confirm that there's no activity, ma'am? Yeah, uh, we don't necessarily use fluorescein to confirm activity, although it will show hyperfluorescence and staining at sites of activity. We basically look at the lesion and compare it to old photographs. So if you have old photographs to compare the lesion to see if there's any increase in size. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vina, don't forget that this MRI finding may be an artifact. Mm -hmm. The child may not be fully sedated, may be moving when they did the MRI. There's some calcium there that's interfering with the you know shadowing and things like that. So there may be some issues in the interpretation, it maybe it's an artifact and not real. So like Carol Shields mentioned, just follow up may, may be more revealing. Yeah, we've done three MRIs, sir. They showed, all show the same. Unfortunately, they all showed discontinuity at the same point. So, so I have a question at this point uh, related to Dr. Naring's question, Dr. Shields and Dr. Arun. So when you do like a heavy laser therapy, you know, uh, there are uh, institutes who does do transpupillary thermotherapy and there are groups who does green laser also. Can that cause, if it's really heavy, uh, thinning of the sclera? No, I mean, we've done it for melanomas all the time. You can get extra ocular extension and that's coming from existing vascular channels. But I don't think the TDD is causing actual scleral perforation, so to speak, and creating the tumor to spread. Carol? Yeah, no, I would agree with that. But we, you know, we look at all, all of our uh, macular scars with OCT. And we do find when we do TTT uh, <laughs> that you, of course, lose the choroid. And sometimes you might get a little bit of bowing of the sclera outwards, but we've never seen extra, extra scleral extension from our TTT. Something to keep in mind. And maybe, you know, the treatment that uh, Dr. Narang was talking about, maybe previous consolidation has caused a little bowing of the sclera. Who knows? I would be conservative. Yeah, a little bit of thinning probably of the sclera yes. because of the heavy yeah, laser. Yes. Yeah. I would say that was treatment nav patient and at the center, he was advised enucleation. So he came to our center and we couldn't figure it out what to do. So we were like planning, let's go ahead with black. All right, so uh, uh, here we are with time's up. If any more uh, final question, we can take one more. Yeah, I, I would like to ask a question of Dr. Singh and uh, his beautiful presentation on iris lesions. Well, he knows everything about genetics and I would like to know, is there any use of adding genetics to of the tumor when you doubt the diagnosis of an iris tumor? What do you think, Arun? <laughs> so nevus versus melanoma. Uh, a few things, uh, let's say, iris melanoma, and only limited genetic profile is available because many studies didn't include iris melanoma, they tend to have better genetic profile, more likely to be diasomic than monosomic, even if they're melanomas. So if I did say, we know from like class one, class two, and similarly, let's say monosomy, diasomic, 90% or so of iris tumors are going to be diasomic or class one. So, so genetic diagnosis therefore will not really tell me difference from nevus to melanoma. And in the end, diagnosis of malignancy is, is cytological, histopathologic, pathologic, whatever you want to call it. We cannot just treat a patient based on monosomy theory, because that's kind of moving away from the traditional pathologic country. You are a pathology background. 
Um, we need pathologic confirmation. So I would go with cytology or histopathology if I can get a tissue, yeah. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, doctor, any concluding remarks, ma'am? Dr. Karen? Dr. Arun, may I ask? Yeah, ask the one final question. During block brachytherapy for the posterior ubel melanoma, uh, patient may have uh, red, uh, radiation induced retinopathy or cystoid macular edema. So, how you prevent or minimize Dr. Singh uh, during uh, block radiotherapy for posterior melanoma? So, number one, Dr. Carol Shields has published a major paper on it to say that anti VEGF agents are very effective compared to control. They say, kind of retrospective study with historic controls, but still the data reveals that the role of anti-VEGF, they've also published studies on the use of steroids, uh, periocular and even intra intraocular in some, some, some other studies to say that there is some beneficial aspect. But just want to highlight that going forward later this year, there will be initiation of DRCR network study on management, diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera, of radiation retinopathy. So this question hasn't been settled yet, and that will be a three-arm study, randomized prospective multi-center study between observation versus steroid versus uh, anti-VEGF uh, at the time of plaque insertion or removal. So right from time go, time zero, you're treating the patient to prevent, delay, and then later on to manage the onset of radiation retinopathy. So this question needs to be addressed and we will be in a big trial coming soon. Thank you. Great. Well, I would like to thank everyone for their part participation. We have people from North America, from Europe, from Asia, all working together. I think this was a wonderful, informative session on intraocular tumors. I thank Dr. Chala for organizing this and bringing in all the experts from around the world. And I thank our Indian colleagues for allowing us to participate in their uh, conference. It's been uh, a wonderful experience and I've learned a lot from everybody. Thank you all. All right. Before I extend my thanks to everybody, let us have put a good smile. We'll have a virtual picture being taken here. Atulji, can you have a virtual picture dissected, please? Yes, sir. Everybody, if you can uh, turn on your videos, so we'll see everybody's face here. Dr. Usha Kim, is it possible for you to, both the Dr. Ushas, in fact? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. All right. Atulji, you can take our picture now. It's ready? Yes. Done, sir. All right. So, ladies Thank and you. gentlemen. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, I would like to thank all the Thank chairpersons, co-persons, convener, co-convener, moderator, and panelists for being here on the virtual dais. And I'm your MOC Himai signing off for this session. For being with us. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful Bye. session. Wonderful Thank session. Bye-bye. Thank you. Really Bye. enjoyed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's not easy. You have to choose. I mean, you have to choose the right people. It's, it's to